And we are now recording. And I, I can see that. Great. All right. Go ahead. Well, good morning, Sue. Thank you again so much for, for coming back. I think this is our, our fourth seating uh, uh, for this oral history. Um, just my normal disclaimers to remind you this is not a private conversation and will ultimately be made available to the public like the other interviews that are already online. Um, I want this to be a enjoyable experience for you so if at any point I'm getting into territory that is less than fun or uncomfortable um, or that you want to take a break just let me know any of those things we can take a break or re redirect. Um, and hopefully I'll be talking as little, little as possible and as, uh, as articulately as possible, um, but just know that I am certainly tuned in and, and closely, closely listening. So today is Friday, August the 7th, 2020, and my name is Andy Reisinger, and I'm interviewing Sue Thrasher uh, as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project, and we're living in the midst of a of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, so everything is being done remotely. So I'm here at my home in Decatur, Georgia, uh, and Sue is at her home in Savannah, Tennessee. And before beginning, if I can just once again get your verbal uh, consent to be recorded. Yes. Excellent. So. As we just talked before the interview, we've, we've covered a lot of ground right. um, and uh, a, a fair amount of, of, your, of your life, but still, um, there's still a ways to go. You, you've had a, a, a lot of activity. Sure, and, it would take so long. <laughs> and involved in, in lots of things. Um, and so as we discussed before we, we started recording, I had a couple different ideas of, of where we might start. Uh, and in our last interview, we, we did begin engaging uh, the history of your work and involvement with the Great Speckled Bird. And I want to delve back in and explore more deeply. But I did have a couple um, follow-up questions from having listened to our previous interviews over the last couple days. Uh, and I'll try to take them in, in chronological order. Uh, okay. The first, and, and, and there are just, just three, I think. And the first was, um, you talked about uh, in the early 60s when you were in college and becoming involved, and, and I guess particularly once you had moved to Skerritt and Nashville and becoming involved in, in civil rights activity and activism, um, with SNCC and the Nashville Christian Leadership Council, the Joint University uh, Council for Human Relations. Um, and I, I was curious, what was the focus of the, the demonstrations, the meetings, the strategy of the organization or the organizations at the time? Like when you were going to mass meetings or the other meetings, what was being discussed? What was the evolving strategy? And then when you were engaged in activity, public activity, what did that look like? Okay. Uh, well, I, I think I would separate them into two different categories. Um, the mass meetings held in Nashville, which were uh, really significant for me, um, would be that was a part of the Nashville Christian Leadership Council, I believe it was called, not conference. But the Nashville Christian Leadership Council was a member organization of the Southern Conference, uh, of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization. So Nashville was, and Nashville had been a, a hotspot for civil rights activities and had phenomenal leadership coming out of the movement there. Um, I arrived in Nashville in the fall of 61, and the year before that, there had been major, the major sit-in movements had occurred in Nashville, with people like Diane Nash and Jim Bevel and so forth, leading um, 
the movement there and John Lewis and others. Um, but there was still a very active movement there. Uh, so the Nashville Christian Leadership Council, which was the, the sort of adult organization, would hold mass meetings. And I sometimes as much as once a week, I believe, I'm not sure about this to tell you the truth, but there were ongoing mass meetings where people would gather and there would be speeches and talks about strategy and so forth. Now, I'm sure, uh, although I was not privy to them, that there were meetings beyond that uh, among the ministers and the leadership of that organization with Kelly Miller-Smith, Andrew White, C.T. Vivian, Metz Rollins, all of the, the people who were in the leadership then uh, that I don't know about so much. But I know that there was, uh, you know, there was this very active organization and it was very connected to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee group, SNCC. And it would be the, the students who would be in the demonstrations mostly, not so much the adults. Um, and during the time I was there, it moved from being primarily college students to being high school students. Um, and uh, I think before that, it had been all high uh, college students. Uh, not to say that college students didn't participate. Uh, the SNCC leadership at that time was really the leaders of those demonstrations, walking with people downtown, giving directions and so, and so forth. So the demonstrations that came out of Kelly Miller Smith's church were large mass demonstrations, mostly of students, still going to places that were segregated downtown and trying to get them to open. Um, and I believe it was places like maybe, I'm, and I'm not remember, I may not be remem remembering the name correctly, but the CNS cafeteria or one of the downtown cafeterias, uh, uh, maybe still Woolworths, although I'm not sure the date when that actually integrated. But there were still places downtown that were segregated and that was still the focus. Uh, to do that. Um, the, the, the Nashville story was written about in the Nashville Tennessean by David Haberstam, who was a young reporter, a very young reporter on the Nashville Tennessean at the time. And he documented uh, daily in the Nashville Tennessean what was happening. So I, I think that period of time in Nashville was well documented. Uh, in terms of the movement there by Haberstam. And he later did the book, The Children, about the leadership of SNCC uh, that was present in Nashville at that time because John, Diane, Nash, and all of those people were so young and doing such spectacular things. And so that book is a remarkable story about Nashville during that time. Uh, the other, uh, there were other demonstrations uh, that came out of the Joint University Council on Human Relations. And those were very targeted toward uh, near the campus, like the little campus grill that had discriminated against uh, the Skerritt student. Um, and uh, we picketed, and that was mostly uh, students from Vanderbilt, Peabody, and Skerritt although I'm sure that we were occasionally joined by some of the SNCC people in those demonstrations. But that would have been primarily white students marching up and down in front of this little campus grill. Um, and there was another instance in which uh, Archie Allen and the Joint University Council people planned what we called a sip-in at Morrison's cafeteria. Uh, which was not downtown, but on West End Avenue um, between Fisk and the other universities there. And Morrison's had been refusing to serve people. And so the idea was that white students would go inside and take a table and order a cup of coffee and sit there forever and hold a table so that other people couldn't use it. I, I, have no, I don't have any recollection of how successful that was. But I know we did that as, and I believe that 
the SNCC people were also marching outside at the time. Um, so th those are the kind of things that were going on during that time. But there was, a, there was still a substantial direct action movement of demonstrations and of, of you know, I was, I think I mentioned earlier, I worked, I stayed in the office, back at the office of the Kelly Miller Smith's church, sort of uh, taking care of the phone and doing things there. And, you know, I would see these very young kids come back with their heads bloody because it was, there was still a good bit of violence, not so much from the police, I think, but from um, white bystanders that the police did not interfere with. Does that help you in terms of giving you a picture of Nashville? Absolutely. I, I really was just curious of the focus and what the activities, actions uh, were to make sure that I, I wasn't just assuming that it was focused on desegregation and yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, uh, I know that there's, I, I hope someday somebody writes a book in addition to Haberstown's book, The Children, but I hope someday somebody writes a book about the Nashville movement. Archie Allen has kept threatening to do that and he would be a good person to do it. But it just had such layers of leadership uh, and um, there that I think it was an amazing story uh, about, uh, about the civil rights movement. And it, uh, I think before I came, well, it was before I came, it didn't happen, but Alexander Luby was a lawyer in Nashville, uh, well known for his activity in the NAACP, and his partner was a man named Avon Williams, and Luby's house was bombed uh, before I arrived. So there had been violence uh, directed at the black community leading up to these demonstrations. The more people were active, the, there was more violence leveled against them, just as there was in Birmingham and other cities. Uh, Shuttlesworth House was bombed in Birmingham and, um, you know, King was threatened. In, uh, so it, it, that Nashville had the same kind of pushback in terms of the violence there. Say that last part one more time, You're, the video froze. Oh, okay. Nashville had, uh, there had been violence in the, in the city uh, just like in other southern cities, and push back against the movement there so that uh, Alexander Luby's house was bombed. Uh, and, but I, I'm comparing that with the other cities as well, like Fred Shuttlesworth house had been bombed in Birmingham and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Nashville did not escape that, uh, and Luby in particular was targeted. But Alexander Luby and Avon, I mentioned, I tended to mention the ministers who were involved in the National Christian Leadership Council, but there were also businessmen from the black, businessmen from the black community and women leaders there who were really phenomenal leaders. Um, uh, Reverend Lawson, speaking at John Lewis's funeral just last week, mentioned many of those names of people in the Nashville movement and paid homage to the Nashville movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a power. Luby, Luby and Avon Williams were the two people were, were prominent, but there were certainly a whole layer of people underneath them who were not ministers, who were uh, active participants in the Nashville Christian Leadership Council. Well, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, the other question, one of the other questions I wanted to follow up on, we, we had talked about at the, I think at the tail end of our last interview of your family and how they responded to your evolving active and, you know, career uh, doing a lot of this, uh, a lot of this work and then some of the tensions that came up. I also, was curious, um, you had been so involved 
in the church as a youth and attended religious institutions and then I think noteworthy were working for the Methodist publishing house as you were doing a lot of this initial work. Um, how, how did, and, and, and I, you probably can't explain it that there was one consistent uh, response from the church, but can you speak a bit about how public you were with, with the, what you were doing and also just what messages and responses were coming from the church or members of these communities? Um, I, I didn't hide things the year I worked at the publishing house. I, and we had been, as a student at Scarrett, when we were getting involved, um, we were quite public. Of course, we were, you know, we were demonstrating uh, close by and we were asking um, other students to join us. So that was quite public. And there was, uh, you know, we ended up being a small group of people within the campus, or the Scarrett campus I'm talking about, who supported it and who were activists. I think that's always the story. It, um, I think there's some, and, and I think that there were other Scarrett students who just did not want to get involved in direct action. They wanted to do, they wanted to do it through the church or work for human rights in some other ways. Um, I think people were a little frightened uh, sometimes about what we were doing um, because it was very different, uh, you know, to go out on the street carrying a sign was a whole level of involvement that people weren't used to. Um, so we were public there and I was not, I didn't hide my activism at the Methodist Publishing House, but I showed up at 8.30 and worked until 4.30 or whatever time it was. And I didn't, you know, I, there was no internet then, there was none of that stuff. So I just focused on my work while I was there. But I, I remember the 1963 March on Washington happened while I was working there. And I remember trying to hear news of it throughout the day and, and everybody was talking about it, of course, because it was national news. And I remember, um, feeling a little separate from, from what was going on there. It, this is probably a good time, as good a time as any to talk about my, um, I don't want to say love hate, but my ambivalent relationship with the church. Uh, I think I said earlier that um, I had sort of had it with the Methodist church when they refused to allow Abel Musarewa's wife to become a member at the Belmont Methodist Church, but it was even after that that I went to work with the Methodist Publishing House. Um, but I, I was, over this period of time, I was definitely uh, feeling that the church was not living up to its, to what it said it believed in, to its principles and its core beliefs. Um, and it was that for me, it was more about, uh, feeling that the church wasn't living out Christian values as much as it was about the institution making the wrong decisions. Uh, I just felt, and, and part of that was because I felt so strongly um, that my own sense, my own activism came from a deep sense of the values I had learned in the church. So uh, much like John Lewis, I didn't disconnect uh, the things I had learned in the church from, from the values I was learning uh, when I was becoming active. I mean, I believed, I mean, I felt like I had been taught about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man at a small Methodist church near here, near Savannah, when I was a young child. And I believed that. So I didn't understand why other people didn't believe that. And, and that, to me, that was just sort of bedrock belief. Um, and uh, so I, but, but I think the reason I was so open to being engaged in the movement was because it was uh, living out the values I had been 
taught in the church. But, and I was pretty, you know, I felt like I was leaving the quote institutional church, not leaving my own religious values or my own um, principles and beliefs um, so much, but finding a way to put them into practice in different situations. Um, and I did not, I did not return to going to church as a member until many years later. And actually only when I moved back to Savannah, Tennessee. Um, I was not, I was, for all of those many years I was away, I was not an active member of a church. Mm -hmm. Feel free to press me if there's something else I need to uh, explain more. No, no I, I just was really interested um, that, and, and having read about some others experiences like I, I think particularly maybe reading Bob Zellner's uh -huh. memoir and the experience that he had at some religious uh, colleges and right. you know being run out and and ban and I and I'm thinking that that was, was some Baptist institutions. Mm -hmm. um, no, Bob's father was a Methodist preacher. Oh. Although he, and he went to a small uh, Methodist school in Alabama. Okay. It may, have, it, it may have been another institution that he was talking about in that particular situation. But uh, yeah, he went, his father was a Methodist preacher. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But, but that was in my head and formed yeah. where I was getting this curiosity. And I was, yeah, and just the, as you pointed out previously, the contradictory <laughs> nature, and as you've just talked about, of the central principles and even, I, I forget what the term that you used, but the central doctrine or right, right. Of, of Methodism that you used when you wrote that s statement for the student. Right. So, right. The discipline the, of the Methodist church, it was called. Yeah. And that the students did not support you in that. No, no. no shocking to me. <laughs> yeah. But, but that also at the same time that, that Scarrett is integrated and, you know, you, you've mentioned um, the, the meeting center in Mississippi, the Presbyterian. Matt Beulah. Yeah, yeah, gathering place. That, so again, a lot of this, and, and, and is, you know, well documented in the history of this. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it, it's still fascinating to me, and I wanted to get your personal take and experience I may have said this earlier, but I think there was a, dis it was true in Sock, and I think it was also true in SNCC. There was a distinct difference in the activists who were Southern, who mostly came out of church backgrounds. And that was true in SNCC for our students, certainly John Lewis being one of the best examples of that. Um, and and the, the people who got involved in the movement from say Howard University, the, the Northern students who tend, and, and, all, and with SOC it would be the Southern students came out of more church backgrounds. The SDS students that we interacted with from the North tended to come out of more intellectual backgrounds. Uh, and the same thing was true, I think, and in, in, in with the black organizations, with the SNCC people from the South coming out of church backgrounds and uh, the Northern students coming out of more intellectual, uh, secular backgrounds, so to speak. That may be a vast overstatement, but it was certainly my observation. Uh, and I, 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 I still believe it uh, to this day, the, that, that regional difference is there in terms of people's um, the way people came into the movement. And, and, and I also think in SNCC, and I'm, I may be just pontificating here about things I don't really know about, but I think in SNCC, uh, J John Lewis, for instance, had a deep, deep commitment to nonviolence. And that was definitely related um, 
to his religious background and his religious beliefs. Other people, um, I think, saw it more as a strategy and a tactic. And that separation you could, would also be more north-south, I think, for the students in SNCC. It'd be interesting to hear Jim Lawson talk about this. Mm, yes. Can you explore a little more or, or possibly give an example of, of when you say uh, being motivated by or in your uh, activism being driven by a religious motivation or, or orientation versus an intellectual? Is that like sort of am i understanding that like faith is is well i right i you know i i wasn't particularly well read in political theory for instance i i you know had not certainly had not read marx uh would have considered that radical communism i'm sure at the time uh but uh, you know beyond marx just political theory i was i was not well read in and um and I think most of us who were involved in SOC weren't uh, and didn't know, weren't, um, were not used to having a political analysis of situations at the time that we got involved in the movement. We were much more coming from a place of uh, values and what we thought was right and wrong more than any political analysis of the situation. Um, and those were skills that I felt like I learned over time and was very grateful uh, that the movement helped, helped me in many ways. I know I talked in, in the last interview about the, the Institute for Policy Studies and how important that was for me, where I really met people who were doing policy work and really, uh, so that whole intellectual world opened up to me in many ways because of my involvement in the movement, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, I think before that I came from more, I just came from more of a place of passion uh, and what I, mm -hmm. what I cared about uh, more than anything else. I, I don't know that I would have a critical thinker <laughs> early on. You know, I think I got better at it, but um, it was not something that had been demanded of me. And having said that, I think back about my classes at Scarrett, and uh, I don't want to make I don't want to denigrate those because there were excellent classes where we were pressured to think and, and analyze and so forth. But um, still, the Institute for Policy Studies was a massive step up from anything I've done before. Great. That, that really is helpful. The last thing that I, that, that having listened to our, our previous interviews that I did not pick up on that I would like to now, you had mentioned uh, your relative who became governor, Governor Blanton, and the, the scandal that he got in, and you, and you made a reference of, of just how, how much that affected your family. Yeah. Um, can you say a little, a, a, a bit about what that effect was? Well, it, it affected my, uh, it affected my sort of extended family more than my immediate family. But uh, Ray Blanton, who was the governor of Tennessee, was uh, my first cousin. And he was put out of office uh, by a, man, by a man who later became Senator Fred Thompson was the lawyer who helped put him out of office uh, for 
and a scandal that involves selling pardons. Now, Ray personally was uh, believed was against the death penalty. And he worked closely with people in Nashville who opposed, uh, more progressive people who opposed the death penalty, including Will Campbell. But within his administration, apparently, um, and I think it's been proven, there was, uh, it was rife with corruption where they were actually selling pardons uh, uh, to inmates in prison and so forth. And uh, I think a woman who was on the parole board brought all of this out, a woman named Marie. There was a film, there was actually a Hollywood film made about this starring Fred Thompson, <laughs> <laughs> who loved a camera. Um, but uh, Ray was, uh, you know, he was my mother's sister's boy. Um, and so it affected the family. Um, my mother had, would often babysit for Ray's children. So she felt very close to him. And she had to, when she died in her house, there was the formal portrait of Governor Ray Blanton in her living room because, you know, she, he, he was family to her. And um, she defended, she didn't defend what he had done, but she, you know, she certainly loved him as an individual and stay, we stayed in and stayed in touch with the family. My mother and her sister, uh, Ray's mother and another sister of theirs became very close in their old age and hung out together and had lunch and, you know, stayed together. Um, but it did affect the family to have that kind of scandal. And it certainly hurt the Democratic Party in the state of Tennessee, I think. Mm -hmm. It's all very, uh, it, you know, it's easy to find uh, because this, uh, the guy who wrote the book, Peter Moss, the guy, I think, the, who wrote the book about Serpico, I think I'm right that it was him, wrote a book about this uh, called Marie, which is about this woman who was on the parole board. Um, and so it, it was a very national scandal when it happened. And Ray had been a member of Congress prior to being governor. And it was, it was very close in my family because my father worked for the Blantons. The, the, the family had a bridge construction business. And my, my guess is that the bridge construction business was also rife with corruption and that people were doing favors under the table all the time. And I don't think this was, and I certainly don't think this was um, just my family members who were doing this. I think it's a way that the system worked uh, in terms of contracts by the state at the time. So I think that, uh, you know, selling pardons was probably uh, like rigging a bid for building a bridge. It was paid some money in order to do it. Um, but my father had worked as a carpenter with, with uh, when he wasn't, when he wasn't farming, that was what he did. Uh, with the Blanton family. He's, uh, I, I think I may have showed you when I, when people come to visit me here, I always take them to Shiloh Military Park and Ray is buried in the Shiloh Cemetery. Uh, so I always take them by and tell them this scandalous story about my family. <laughs> yeah. And so was, was, was the scandal mainly manifest in, to, to the family as just bad talking? Or do you, do you think that it actually destroyed relationships and that there was, you know, an ostracism from communities or? You know, I don't. I don't really know. I was away at the time this happened. I was in, um, I believe I was in um, Washington, actually, not Atlanta. Um, I, I should check the dates. But I, I, I wasn't, I was aware of what was happening, but I wasn't, it wasn't a major, major uh, 
it, it didn't seem to create that many waves really immediately that I was aware of. Now it may have just been because I wasn't paying attention to it. Um, I know my mother was quite upset by it, but um, the Blantons continued to live in the little town next, next to here, Adamsville, and uh, you know, we're still prominent citizens. And um, uh, Jean eventually, I don't think Jean, Jean was Ray's brother, had been involved in all this. He kept doing his business out of Nashville. Um, so uh, I don't think it, um, you know, it, it, there's now a, a marker in Adamsville that talks about Ray Blanton um, and people have somewhat tried to resurrect him, I guess, in a way. Um, so I'm sure the, the community was a bit divided and it was, of course, it was a major political issue in the state. Um, but I, I, my family just sort of, it didn't, nobody was going to, uh, no one in my immediate family would have, uh, in much the same way that my family would not have sort of not had anything to do with me because of my civil rights activity. Nobody in the family was not going to have anything to do with, with Ray's family or Ray himself uh, mm -hmm. because of this. I mean, he was, as, as, as Neil Herring say, would say, bite the bullet, Sue, he's family. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Which is what Neil told me during that time, I recall. Mm. Well, very I was very far away from it, to tell you the truth. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't paying that much attention. I knew it was happening, but I wasn't paying that much attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the fallout seems yeah. largely political, but you know, people's yeah. livelihoods weren't destroyed irrevocably. And I, I, I just don't know. I'm not, I wasn't that close to those, those cousins were older. So I just, I, to tell you the truth, I just don't know. Well, good. That's on. Those are all of my my follow up questions from from the many hours of, of previous. <laughs> really. Uh, so. Well, uh, I have a couple of things I wanted to go back and uh, uh, sort of uh, correct. Really, mm -hmm. the record. Uh, and I, let me just look at my notes here. I know the first thing I wanted to correct. I when I was listening to the interview again, I had gone out to uh, Tucson, Arizona. And I think in the interview, I said, I went to New Mexico. I went to Arizona uh, and stayed with Clay and Velva East uh, and, at, at their home in Tucson when I did the interviews with Clay East and with J.R. Butler. And it was, and uh, so I did that series of interviews with Clay and then Clay East drove me to Phoenix to interview uh, J.R. Butler. And, uh, I mistakenly said in the interview that it was H.L. Mitchell who drove me to Phoenix, and it was not, it was Clay East. Uh, they, they stayed a little bit in touch during that time. Clay was not present when I interviewed J.R. Butler, but he did take me there. Uh, so I just wanted to make that correction. And the other thing is I uh, messed up on the names of the three civil rights workers who were killed in Mississippi at the beginning of Mississippi summer, I believe I called uh, Andrew Goodman, I called him James Goodman, and it was of course uh, Andy Goodman and James Cheney and Mickey Schwerner were the three, uh, three civil rights workers who were killed in Mississippi. People mostly use their, their last names. So I apologize for that. And I think that's it in terms of corrections, but I did want to correct those two things. Yeah. Excellent. So now we can move move back to your time at the the bird, which we had been talking about the last time. Um, and so, just to 
refresh the, the listener or viewer, you had moved to Atlanta in 1969 uh, with the, to work on beginning to, to form uh, the Institute for Southern Studies with Howard Romaine and um, Julian Bond. Right. And, uh, you know, had set up residence, of, you know, in the building adjacent to Tom and Stephanie Coffin and ultimately moved into the other side of the duplex. So became enmeshed in this world and, and, and started participating in, in the bird. Um, and so I wanted to ask, did you understand that the bird had a particular vision or a model of what it was hoping to be? Or did you have an idea personally of, of something that you wanted to work towards making the bird? No, I certainly didn't have a vision of what I thought the bird should be. I, I did think that the bird uh, was working that vision out as it went in much the same way that we were working out the Institute for Southern Studies as we went along. Um, no, I felt uh, there was, um, there was just a lot of energy around underground papers in the country at the time. And I think the bird established itself rather quickly as one of the major underground newspapers in the country and one of the better underground newspapers in the country. I would argue that the bird was right up there with the, uh, the rag coming out of Austin, Texas, and the, the papers coming out of San Francisco, names of which I'm blanking on at the moment, but there were, there were major underground papers coming out of San Francisco and California and New York and so forth. And I think the bird quickly developed a reputation as being one of the best underground newspapers in the country. And it was very connected uh, to that network uh, through Liberation News Service. Um, Ray Mungo did a book about the Liberation News Service and it was certainly uh, uh, I, I was thinking when I was listening to the interview, uh, the Liberation News Service was really, uh, whoever conceived that and thought it up, uh, it was a brilliant idea because I don't think the, I, I, the bird uh, really was very dependent on Liberation News Service in terms of international news coverage because I was editing some of the international news and the Liberation News Service allowed, you know, as a, I think you subscribed and paid a fee, but then you could use anything that was in that service. So it really helped support local papers in that sense. And the bird was uh, very connected through that network. But I, and, and uh, the bird was both political and countercultural. Uh, uh, the countercultural movement at that point was not that political, and, and at least I didn't view it as that political. And yet the bird um, was managed to hold both in its pages, uh, and and with with ease and with uh, competence, uh, it was able to talk about music and uh, local political issues and also to comment on international issues and the, the movement and so forth. So uh, I, I think it was partly because the people who formed the bird, Howard and Jean being two of them coming out of SOC, and then Tom Coffin being the first editor of the bird, uh, I think people had a political vision of what they thought the, the, the paper should be. Um, and it was one that I felt very at ease with. Um, but I felt that I was, uh, it wasn't so much that I brought a vision to it at all as it was a part of my learning curve during the time. I mean, it was, it was introducing me uh, to a large part of the Atlanta community and especially the countercultural movement. Um, 
otherwise I might have been just in my office, you know, thinking about uh, Southern, you know, what eventually the, the work, the research we were doing at the Institute or whatever, but it, uh, I think it uh, was a great connector for people. So I, I learned uh, from that situation more than bringing uh, uh, my own vision to it. I certainly had a vision of what I thought was important and brought that to the editing work. Uh, I would, for instance, I was interested, had a long-term interest in international issues and brought that. And uh, I'm sure that was, and what I chose to submit for publication, uh, no doubt that showed, um, but, um, things like the Women's Caucus, which I did talk about some last time. Um, those were all new things that I was, we were just uh, um, finding our way with um, as we went. So I would say we were building uh, something rather than, um, I, nobody had a blueprint for anything. Let me just put it there. We, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were, uh, what, what I later called, what Palo Freire has a wonderful phrase called making the road by walking, uh, which is the name of the book um, that we later did with him. And uh, I think it's a, a great expression and it certainly um, sums up a lot of my own life in terms of, uh, of making it up as we went. Does that help about the bird? Yes, yes. Okay. And you, there you, you were talking about um, how well the bird was able to, to hold together the political and the, the cultural, countercultural um, within its pages. Yeah. Um, can you expand on that to to talk about the ease with, with which they were able to hold these, these together in the production and the, what has been des described as interminable meetings, the, the collective meetings, were those things held together with such ease there as well? Uh, I, I think so, although I, uh, I would go to the, the, the co-op meetings uh, once a week. Uh, I, I, should, I should state again here that I was a member of the co-op, not a staff member. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, a, more peripheral, uh, certainly to the bird than the staff would have been. And uh, I, I would rely on the answers of the people who work there full time more than my observations. But I think so. I think people who uh, came with articles that they wanted to be published would make a case for them um, and argue for their publication. And uh, as I recall, the meetings were excellent in the sense that people discussed what would go in the bird, what kind of graphics it might have and so forth. And sometimes things got left out because there wasn't room uh, to publish them or it wasn't considered as important as something else. Um, and sometimes you needed some filler for uh, three inches, uh, which Liberation News Service was great for that kind of thing. Um, so I, I, think, uh, I think people did do a good job of holding that together. And I think people were, uh, the, the staff and the co-op itself had a, was enough diversity inside it that there were people who were able, you know, to represent various viewpoints. And, um, and I'm talking, I'm not talking diversity here so much in terms of race, because I think there were, there were some uh, staff members who were people of color or black, uh, but not many, uh, as I recall. So it was it was more a diversity of opinion and uh, whether people were coming from a perspective of music 
as I would say, Miller Francis was a very good, was excellent at um, uh, sort of cultural criticism uh, and considered himself a cultural critic. Uh, and there would often be arguments about those things, but they were um, fair. You know, I, I don't, I think they were good uh, arguments, uh, good discussions about what was important to go into the newspaper. But again, I would think anybody who was on staff would be able to answer that in a much more in-depth way than I could. Because I imagine a lot of those decisions on a daily basis were made while people were working together, um, not, not so much as, as well as in the meetings that occurred. Mm -hmm. But I would go once a week to the co-op meetings, uh, but, uh, and maybe dart in and out to do some work. Uh, I was certainly, you know, comfortable and, and uh, at home there, but I was not on staff there. Yeah. When you say that you would go to the, the co-op meetings, where, where were the offices located in the years that you were participating? Um, it, the first place uh, that I recall uh, was, uh, I think there was a big house on 14th Street. Is that right? Was it 14th Street? And then later there was a, more like a, a small warehouse office I think, was it on North Avenue? I, I don't remember the address, but I think it was North Avenue. And that was the office that I most remember. And I know later there were other offices and other houses, but I wasn't that involved at that point. Um, okay. And what was the atmosphere like of these, of these offices, you know, physically? Uh, as well as, as socially, but. Well, a, a lot of creativity, I think. Uh, uh, some, uh, you know, occasionally bruised egos, but a lot of creativity and um, a, a sense of doing something that was important. There was always, always the need to, um, sell a lot of papers. People who were on staff would often go out and sell papers in order to make more money. People were not, people were not living the high life. It was, you had to, I, I had a salary at the Institute for Southern Studies, not a huge one, but I had a salary. Um, and, but, uh, and I did occasionally go out and sell birds, but I never liked it. I never, I was not a hawker or a marketer. Um, there were some brilliant set bird sellers who were able to sell and hawk a lot of birds but um, um but i think it was just a a really creative time uh with a lot of political discussion going on and a lot of uh cultural things going on um as well i i can't be a lot more specific than that i think And you talked about the the diversity, largely of perspectives that that were evident within within the the paper, um, but that that diversity wasn't wasn't in terms of like racial diversity. But can you talk about how other issues of identity identity categories among along racial, gender, sexuality, um, how those played out or, or um, um, were made manifest at the bird? Well, I, I, I could speak most to the issue, the gender issues, because of being a, a member of the Bird Women's Caucus. And uh, the, um, so 
that was often had some tenseness to it, uh, partly because of relationships within the bird staff and the co-op. Uh, some people were married to each other. Um, other people were seeing each other uh, at different times. Uh, but uh, the, and, and the, the women's, as I recall, the Bird Women's Caucus would often make a report at the co-op meetings and, and ask for certain things or quote, demand certain things. I think there was, uh, and, and I should not talk, um, talk at length about this because I really don't recall and I wasn't that central to the discussions. I think that the issues around uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual issues at that time, transgender was, was not in the mix, except as something exotic that was often reported in the bird around a, a performer there named Diamond Lil. Uh, but it was not, um, it, the term LGBT, T was not uh, not current at the time, certainly. Um, but even issues around gayness were not often discussed at that point. And I would say that there was not um, uh, the bird probably was on the ahead of its time in 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 terms of dealing with those issues. But they were just beginning to be dealt with. Um, the the movements that I was coming out of, uh, SOC, SNCC, SDS, did not had not dealt with those issues at all, uh, really. Um, but I think the bird was probably ahead of its time in terms of beginning to address and and deal with those issues. And even even though I described the uh, the the dealings with transgender is this more exotic story about Diamond Lil. It was pretty amazing that, that she was a part of the paper and was reported on and uh, uh, I think, and people went to and see, I, yeah. And I think even wrote, it, it wasn't just reporting about, about her, but right. allowing her to have her own voice. Yes, exactly, exactly. Which and was way, way ahead of its time. Yeah, and you know, having since you know, since since the publication didn't rely on just staff writers, but submissions from yeah. anybody who wanted to submit anything, and there were staff who were writing about you know gay lesbian issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. On the staff, but then just the wider community also. Um, right, and and uh, certainly those issues were dealt with in the Bird Women's Caucus and in Atlanta Women's Liberation as well. And can you talk a uh, delve into that? Like, where did the Women's Caucus come from? How did it come into being? Um, what were what was its focus? What demands did it issue at times? Uh, I don't want to answer that because I'm not the person to answer that. The people who could give you a much better answer to that would be Stephanie or Nan, uh, both could speak to that. I believe that I joined it. So I think it was in existence, uh, when I arrived. Becky Hamilton might be another person who could talk about its, uh, origins more. Um, but I, I just don't have the, I don't have the knowledge to answer that question for you in a, in a way that would be responsible. Um, I just, what I recall is that we did meet mostly weekly. There was, uh, uh, there was a moment in which uh, three or four of us sort of met independently and it, it wasn't really around the bird, it was more around uh, political conversations. And we thought of ourselves as a little political caucus. 
um, but not, not, we weren't, didn't see ourselves. We were just interested people in Atlanta. It wasn't uh, necessarily coming out of the bird, but everybody, I think everybody in it was associated with the bird. Um, and there were four of us and we would meet, um, I think we thought of it as secretly <laughs> at the Sparsity because of course nobody would expect a political meeting to be held at a hot dog stand. And, uh, but we called ourselves the Aunt Lydia Club because we all were crocheting at the time <laughs> using this yarn that was called Aunt Lydia's yarn. So it was just a, it was another one of those sort of what I think of now as one of our posturing moments of, um, of uh, political engagement. On the other hand, I think it, the impulses behind it was that we were women who wanted to talk with each other about politics and about gender issues and, and uh, find a way to do that. And so we called ourselves the Aunt Lydia Collective and uh, met at the varsity every so often. <laughs> can, you, can you say who the other members were? Um, Nan, uh, and I believe Stephanie, although I'm not totally certain, and I don't, and I know there was a fourth person, and I don't remember who that was. And is that before Atlanta, Atlanta Women's Liberation came into being, or contemporaneous? No, no I think it was later. I, I think it was uh, much later. Um, I don't remember the exact dates, but um, it was after Atlanta Women's Liberation, for sure, and, and certainly after the Birds Women's Caucus. Sometime there in the mid-70s. Mid mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the, or, so, or early, early 70s, actually, I should say. Mm -hmm. So you weren't able to talk about the, the formation of the, the Women's Caucus and its initial activities, but what do you recall of, of the meetings or how the women came together? What were what was the focus of, of, of the group in the time that you were involved? What are, well, what are some of the big memories about it? I think it was very focused on relationships within the, within the staff and the co-op. So it was literally a caucus within the bird. And so it, it, then it focused on issues that women in that caucus had with the larger staff and the co-op itself. So people would, uh, you know, there would be, uh, would bring forward their disappointments or their issues or anger over something. And uh, that would be talked about. I don't, and I, I'm sorry that I don't remember um, specific things that were demanded because that, that is of course the kind of information that would be most helpful. But I do know that it was, um, it was, I do know that if the Bird Women's Caucus did not meet and did not report regularly, that men's behavior would shift. So I think in many ways that the caucus was a way of helping men change their behaviors and keeping them to it. Uh, and I remember, you know, that was one of the things I noted, and I don't know at what point I noted that, or when I, began, it was more like an observation and an analysis about over time. But I do think that the, the caucus actually provided a way to to really focus on behaviors and change it um, and to uh, help guide people. Now, it, of course, it, I, I think if I had, you know, 
I'm sure the men didn't often see it as a guide. They saw it as a demand or um, a, a, a put down in some ways. But um, it was it was really it was really looking at how our daily behaviors and daily sexism had to be dealt with um, and changed, and how people had to change their attitudes about it and larger issues of, you know, had to do with women's leadership inside the organization, but it also had to do with just small everyday um, interactions um, where there were sexist assumptions or whatever. And all of us were learning. I mean, all of us were learning about this. I mean, uh, it wasn't like the women in the caucus didn't come to it with a full-blown set of ideas about what behavior should be like because we were all growing and changing uh, in this. Would you characterize the, in describing the focus and, and, and how feminism was was brought into being within within the bird you're talking a lot about the relationships and um interacting among people in in real life um can you address at all how this affected what actually went in the paper as well and how what the paper included did not include um well i know that at some point becky and i shared uh became co-editors of women's issues so and I and I don't. I think there may have been somebody before us um, who was in charge. But there was a particular commitment to to publishing stories around women's liberation or issues related to women. Uh, so that commitment was there. And I imagine I don't know at what point someone had been put in charge of of women's issues as an editorial part of the bird. Uh, and but I, I think it was there when I became involved. I think it was already a part of the bird. So I think that was um, I think that commitment was there. And I think that Miller Francis uh, insisted uh, in, in meetings and so forth that the bird also should have a commitment to reporting on gay issues. Um, so I think it was that you know, through that mix um, of people who were in the co-op that that was happening um, and would be reflected then in what, what editorial decisions were made and what was published. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm feeling like uh, I'm not the best person to be answering these. So, um, You'll have to forgive me. <laughs> I know you have. I know you have other people who can answer these questions much better than I can. And other folks have have talked about it. And certainly, there is the the archive of the actual paper itself, yeah. where yeah. you can see a lot of these things, and it's reported on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I I certainly know that with women's issues, there was there was a genuine commitment. Uh, n no questions about it in terms of what uh, of that being reported on. And I think there was also a commitment, uh, even though the staff, the staff in the co-op lacked diversity in terms of its color, uh, I think there was a commitment because of our backgrounds and coming out of the civil rights movement uh, there was a commitment to reporting on issues that had to do with the black community. Um, and not so much at that time, the Latino community or the Hispanic community, 
but certainly uh, commitment to reporting about black workers or uh, issues that have, of, around housing or issues that impacted or anything that the civil rights movement might still be doing. There was a real commitment to reporting on that, even though that diversity was lacking in the staff. I mean, I think everybody, I think everybody on, in the co-op brought that actually. Mm. And do you know, sort of to that point, I, I would take it that your deep friendships uh, and and professional working relationships with many people from the, the civil rights movement, particularly African-American Af African American folks. Um, do, do you know, know whether, how they perceived the bird, whether they were also, you know, aware of what you were doing, were interested reading copy, Uh, I, I think that people who were engaged in the movement, yes, I thought that, I think they saw it as a, I think people saw it as a part of a larger movement, of a larger progressive movement. Um, and so while the bird wasn't, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the organ of a civil rights organization, it, 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 it certainly was, uh, in many ways, an organ of the larger movement. Um, so I think there was interest, and I think that people, the SNCC people who still lived in Atlanta, people like Stanley Wise and Don Stone, I think they read it and, and uh, often I maybe wrote for it or suggested articles for it or things or so forth. I think there was, um, the Black Workers Congress, it was called, uh, was, was active in Atlanta, maybe a little bit later uh, than we're talking about right now in terms of the bird, but there was certainly, um, what's the word, uh, nourishment going back and forth and uh, between people who were engaged in these activities and information, uh, free-flowing information. So I do think that the people who had been involved in the civil rights movement um, supported it. And you've, you, you've talked to, about the relationships and made reference to you know, people's personal relationships, whether they, they be romantic or friendships. And can you explore that a, a little bit more about how you remember the, the relationships among the, among the collective and how, just what those relationships were, but also then how they played out in terms of the, the project of the paper and, and getting it together? Um, well, I, do, I don't want to personalize it. Uh, let me say for first, I do not want to personalize that, but I it just as in any organization, I think, or in any workplace, uh, there were, uh, you know, there were some couples who were married and there were some couples who split up. Uh, during the time. Uh, there were people who had relationships with each other and then would split up. It, it, just, it just happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I, there was, but I don't recall in any case where it had uh, major negative effects on the work um, or acceptance. Of, of people or of their roles um, there. Um, I'm really thinking, I, I guess I'm thinking about 
a sort of a two to three year period here. Um, you know, there was a time when uh, a group went off to the Vince Ramos Brigade in Cuba, um, and some of those were bird people. Um, so it, I, I think, uh, and the dynamics then inside the staff may have been affected by some of these relationships, but not inordinately so uh, that I recall. And again, I was not there on a daily basis. So I don't have a lot to say about that. Yeah. I, I was just curious, like, because as you mentioned in, in a previous session, the bird, you know, whether it wanted to be or not, was, was a big complicated business. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. That, you know, had major responsibilities and was a complicated structure. Right. And unlike, unlike a lot of, you know, private corporations, um, while there might be, you know, friendships and personal romantic relationships within a, a private corporation, that's probably not the, the original groundwork <laughs> for the coming together and the, and maybe even the primary relationship, like there was so much overlap within the bird of, yes, of yeah. friendship groups and then doing this, this complicated professional right. service right. work as well, as well as business. Right, right. And, and rem at this point, there was certainly no, this was an alternative organization. It was an alternative newspaper and it was an alternative organization. So there really were no ground rules um, that for anybody to follow. Um, and, but I think at that time, you know, we're talking about a time in the early seventies when I, my guess is that most corporations didn't have these, um, didn't have the kind of formal structures that say protected women from sexual harassment at that time either. So, uh, you know, the bird was probably maybe even ahead of the curve in terms of being able to figure some of those issues out mm. um, in its revolutionary way. Yes, and as you also had previously mentioned in describing Atlanta when you arrived here, that sort of the, the atmosphere, the energy was yeah. so open and creative yeah. that it allowed a lot of space for curiosity and exploration without prejudging. <laughs> Do you recall, um, any public responses um, to particular issues of the paper um, or any, any issues that stand out more for, to you for what they covered or the, the reaction that they elicited? Um, I think, some of that had happened prior to my arrival on the scene uh, because I think there was, a, there was a, a back and forth between the mayor of Atlanta, Sam Massell, and the bird. Uh, but I think most of that had played because of the bird's reporting on him. But I think most of that, but that had been very public. Uh, and, and the, you know, the bird, the bird took, you know, the bird had no, uh, <laughs> the bird had no respect in a way for authority figures. So the bird, you know, took no prisoners. It, it reported, if it thought Sam Massell was doing bad things, they reported on it. 
So that, but that had played out before I became a member of the co-op, I think. Um, but I remember hearing about it and knowing that that had been a, a big issue for the bird. Uh, but I, I, I think what I would say here is that the bird, because of its diversity of reporting, you might think that an alternative newspaper in Atlanta, Georgia, would, that its audience would be the countercultural movement in Atlanta. And maybe the political, uh, anybody who had, was paying attention to the movements of the time, the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement, for instance. And you could, you could, I think, reasonably expect that to be the major audience of the bird. But I think because the bird did all of this reporting about people like Diamond Lil and about people like Dolly Parton in terms of music, that it had a much wider reading audience. It, not to say that every issue of the bird was read by that audience, but it reached a lot of people because of the articles and the writing it was willing uh, and anxious uh, you know, uh, to cover and do. So the bird, uh, Jean Guerrero started writing about country music. I wrote about country music for the bird. So, and Jean did an interviews with Dolly Parton and, um, you know, suddenly these country music stars were aware of the bird and proud of being, uh, uh reported on in the bird. So it had, um, it had a reach uh, that went beyond what you would normally think of as an alternative newspaper's audience, I think. And I think that's because of the people who were there and, and their interest and their, their ability and willingness to go out and get those stories and report on them and put them in the paper and make it a part of the editorial part of the paper. Mm -hmm. And is there any writing articles that that you researched and, and wrote that stand out the most as as noteworthy, important? Um, no, I wish I could say yes, but no. Um, I I don't believe that I I. Uh, Jeannie Gore, Jean Guerrero's sister, recently brought me issues of the bird that had to do with a series on country music that I had been involved in. Uh, maybe Jean had also been a part of that, but I seem to have written the series on country music. Um, and I'm, but again, and I'm, I'm sure I talked about this in an earlier interview, there was huge overlap in the work that I, work and writing I was doing for Southern Exposure by this time and the bird. So I had, uh, I had gone off to Nashville after finishing the No More Moaning issue of Southern Exposure, just to, mostly to take a break and do something different and ended up doing, then doing a whole series of writings about country music artists uh, because of the interviews that I got during the time I was there. And, uh, we later published a special issue of Southern Exposure on music. Um, but those articles appeared both in, uh, in different formats and different, uh, perhaps even different ways of uh, different articles. They appeared in both Southern Exposure and The Bird. Mm -hmm. uh, so that series on country music, I know, was, uh, I did not do a lot of writing for The Bird, as I recall. I did editing and uh, editing, and then occasionally would submit pieces when I was doing something for Southern Exposure that could be adapted or are used in a different way. Um, but I I don't recall that I was doing a huge amount of writing during that time, unless it was for Southern Exposure. Mm. 
I wish I had a different answer. I wish I could say, oh, yes, that series I did on so-and-so. But no, I don't. Yeah, yeah. And you've, you've explained in the course of, of us talking of that in high school, you were the editor of your, your school newspaper and you were mentored by the, um, by the editor of your town's paper, The Courier. Uh, you worked for the Methodist Publishing House. So you had some, some deep background in, in publication and journalism. Um, yeah, my, well, my, you know, my, uh, such as it was, my goal was to be a journalist initially. Uh, and, but I, but I combined that, uh, but thinking I would become a religious journalist and work for the Methodist. Um, so I did have, I had a long standing interest in journalism and writing. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and a good bit of experience that you then brought to the paper that I'm sure informed your contributions um, and uh, and counsel that you gave gave to the paper would you say that you that the bird facilitated developing additional skills or deepening any of the skills you already had um, it, yes I think it uh, editing uh, making decisions about articles, uh, looking at what should go in, making decisions about what was appropriate and what would, um, what would fit in with issues that we were doing. Yeah, I think so. Even though uh, I, of course, wasn't full time doing that, but in terms of the work I did, yes, I think I did gain skills there. Um, I also, gain knowledge about skills that I did not have. <laughs> and I'm talking specifically about layout and design skills. Uh, I very quickly, because you could, uh, everybody, people could volunteer. You would go in and work on helping lay out the bird, for instance. And I learned very quickly that I was just terrible, terrible at that. And I, I did not, I did not, often try it after that. Um, uh, Stephanie Coffin was brilliant at that, but I, I wasn't, I did not have those skills. And so I didn't try to use those skills later. But I do think just the, you know, being on a paper, making decisions, being a part of the group that made editorial decisions, all of that was, was I think you learn a lot from being in situations like that. And I soaked it right up. Mm. And how would you describe or talk about, compare the decision-making processes at the bird to prior work that you had done with professional organizations like a publishing house, but, but more particularly with SNCC, with SOC, and then ultimately your work at Highlander with Southern Study. The, what were the core values or, or practices in decision-making? Well, I really had only had that experience at the publishing house in terms of uh, uh, a legit job, if you will, before I sort of went off to do, quote, full-time movement work. So I didn't have, I, di I wasn't bringing a lot of experience from that professional sector. Um, but I did have, by that time, I did have a lot. Well, I, excuse me, I should, that's not true. I had been at the Institute for Policy Studies uh, by this time. So, uh, uh, which was, which did have two co-directors, um, but was pretty much, I wouldn't say it was collectively run, but it was collegially run uh, by the fellows and, and by the staff. Uh, so I did, I never felt like, I, I actually never felt at the Institute for Policy Studies that I was in a top-down institution. Um, and I've, I had 
I felt like I could walk into the office of either co-director and make a case for anything I wanted to make a case about. And, and they would listen and, and be respectful of my opinions. So uh, that was, a, uh, I guess, kind of an in-between uh, institution in terms of uh, top down with a, a, a very formalized structure. But the Methodist Publishing House, I had, you know, I had a boss who I worked for, who was an editor. I was a, I was an editorial secretary. So I worked and I, that again was uh, journalistic. And I had gone there for that experience. Um, but because I wouldn't promise to work there for more than a year, they wouldn't hire me as an editorial assistant. They would only give me the secretarial position, but it was an editorial secretary position. And because I wanted to stay in Nashville and work with the civil rights movement, I took that position. So that was a combination of wanting to be geographically in Nashville and have an income more than anything else. But I also, it was a chance to really think through what, whether I wanted to work and whether I'd be a fit for working for the Methodist Church. Um, and it was a good year. I don't, I never regretted the year that I spent there. And I, and I, uh, uh, my boss was very good at what she did as an editor um, and uh, was very easy to work with. Um, but I did, uh, you know, I was, uh, I had a certain position and somebody that I reported to and I was not in any decision-making position at all. So, but, but in SOC and in um, SNCC meetings, was, both were well known for uh, collective decision-makings and interminable meetings. You were in meetings all the time and everybody who wanted to say anything about anything could speak and uh, say their piece and then a decision would be made. And people would try to come to consensus, although voting would be done in the end. Um, but there was an attempt to, to make consensus decisions about things. But it, it, it wasn't just the decision-making, and that was true on the bird as well, I think. The, the co-op meetings, people tried to come to consensus about things. But it was, it was more about, um, uh, discussion of issues and uh, respecting everyone's voice uh, and then making a decision and moving on. Um, I, I know that we talk about interminable meetings, but the fact is that we all learned to get a lot of work done and we all learned competencies and skills uh, during that time about running meetings and about decision making. Um, and about organizational structures, I think, that helped us. Um, and, and certainly that was the case for me. I think working in, um, and I worked, I was in a, often in a peculiar situation, I think, because uh, partly because as a woman being in positions of, that were designated as decision-making positions. For instance, I was the quote, executive secretary of SOC, or I was the co-director of the Institute for Southern Studies. But I knew and everybody else knew that we were a democratic consensus organization. So those titles were more about fundraising or needing a structure or, or whatever. I mean, uh, I, I didn't think that being co-director of the Institute um, ever meant that I made a de final decision about anything uh, that had to do with the organization. And I certainly didn't think that in SOC. And I think we talked about in an earlier interview, uh, a, t a time when I, I was I had to make a decision that I did not agree with and um, and uh, and that so I think all of those organizations that I worked with were were learning uh, and 
I don't want to say playing with, but we're uh, using a, a new kind of decision making inside organizations that was, I think, new. Um, and uh, learning how to do that and, and often being willing to spend the time it took to do that. I mean, if you had a meeting that went from seven o'clock until midnight, uh, but in the course of that meeting, everybody got their say and then a decision was made and you moved on. It was still, I think people thought it was worth it to do that. Did I, I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure. No, absolutely, absolutely. I should say, I don't know what, uh, I'm familiar with the co-op meetings. I don't know what the decision making in, in terms of the staff, I'm sure, and, and you would, you probably know more about this than I do, but I'm, I'm, there must have been staff meetings at the bird in addition to the co-op meetings where decisions were made. So I'm sure there was a, another level of decision making at the bird that went beyond the co-op meetings. And I don't know what that was like because I wasn't there on a daily basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think that that is the case and other, other folks yeah. have talked yeah. about. It. However, there's a lot of absolute interrelation <laughs> between these things, like any yeah. decisions yeah. Yeah. that, you know, sort of editor, editors and staff might be making would ultimately go back to the collective, so. Yeah, yeah. Do you recall any, any major transitions? Because you were living in Atlanta and ostensibly would be involved with the bird from 1969 and then the bird ceased publication in 76. So you were here that whole time. I was, yeah. Do you recall? Um, Any milestones or evolutions, watershed moments? You know, I really don't. And I, uh, I was thinking earlier that I was involved in the co-op for a period of about two or three years. And I think that as we, as we built up, and I was involved early on in the life of the Institute, and I think what must have happened as the Institute began to take up more of my time that I uh, moved farther away from the bird uh, in terms of active involvement in it. Um, I, I know during that first year that I was in Atlanta, I was certainly very involved in it. But I think after that, I may have been more involved in trying to keep the Institute for Southern Studies alive and well and working there. Um, I also went off to Alabama for a period of time to do a series of oral history interviews with Virginia Foster Durer. So I, was, I spent some time in Montgomery uh, away from Atlanta and, and, and I was at that point living in, in the house with Tom and Stephanie Gotham and Doyle Neiman, but I would be away in Alabama. So I, and I was traveling more doing the interview, the or beginning to do the oral history interviews for the Institute. So uh, I, I was just much more peripheral uh, in the later years than I had been in those early years. So I wasn't that familiar with the decisions to actually stop publication of the bird. Um, as, as Tom and Stephanie and, and uh, all of those people who were central to it were. So I don't remember those big moments or the decision to start publishing again uh, with, with new staff coming on at the point where I think Mickey Gilmore and um, Krista Brewer, other people coming at, at when it's, it's restarted publication. I wasn't involved at all uh, during that period. Yeah, and that would be like 73, 74. So then, uh, say, that, say the dates again, Andy, when did it stop publication initially? Well, I don't think it ever 
from the time that it started publication in 1968, there was no interruption until 1976. Like uh -huh. in, in that final year, 75, 76, it did change the, the frequency. Like I think it, the, they scaled back on the number of pages uh -huh. times throughout publication. And in that final year, it, you know, instead of being a weekly, I think went to a bi-weekly and ultimately a monthly. Uh -huh. uh, but there were, there were times that threat is not the right word, but, but waving the flag to the readership and the community that the bird was struggling and would cease, would cease publication if it did not, number one, get new people involved to run the paper because there were transitions of people. Right. People's lives changed and they had to right. do things or also raise more revenue to. <laughs> to right. So there right. were, there were critical junctures, but I think that there were maybe two of those in, in the course of the years, but they were able to weather them and people did step forward and funds were raised to continue public yeah. until that final 76. And then, and then there was the, you would have already been out of Atlanta, but in 84, 85, there was a resurrected bird for a very short period of time uh -huh. uh, that, that several folks from the, the original, um, the original bird. Worked on. Yes, yes. Yeah. But well, I, I, I think that's all. It's one of the reasons I think the series of interviews that you're doing uh, for the archives are so important because I think it was a major institution. And I think being able to look at it over that period of time, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, when was it that 10th Street and the countercultural movement began to shift uh, around that community there? And I know that there's been this 10th Street project um, you know, but that community was so important to the early bird uh, there. And then I know that that shifted over time. So having these interviews and being able to look at it over the long term will be very important, I think. Yeah, and then as a side note, to that point that you raise about the, the hip community and uh, the strip. Um, yeah. Patrick Edmondson does uh, run the the documentation project of the, of the called the Strip Project that's uh -huh. pretty much online. Um, but there also has been a very fantastic dissertation written out of UGA. Uh, oh really? Oh great! By, by a, a scholar, Christopher Huff, um, who writes a lot, a lot, a lot about the bird, but is also looking more looking at the strip and Atlanta at that time and, and this community. Uh, and he beautifully documents uh -huh. the rise of that and, and its origins and ultimately the um, fracturing. Yeah. Yeah. No, great stuff. I did want to also ask in, in, in these years, I think you would have still been been active. Um, were you around when when the offices were firebombed in 1972? I was. Uh, was that the house on 14th Street? No, Our, it was have? it was a house on the backside of Piedmont Park. I think. Oh, I'm drawing, maybe Westminster Drive, is that? The... Yes, I remember there was a, a office on Westminster Drive. Uh, so I would have been there, but I don't remember a lot about it, to tell you the truth. Yeah, uh, fair enough. And I remember working out of that place on Westminster Drive so much. Maybe it's just my fate, my bad memory, but uh, the office I remember the most is the North Avenue office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what you're talking, I, 
I certainly don't want to assume anything, but a, an observation that I'm making is that a lot of the folks in the, the founding years and, and up through 72 or so were a, a cohort of, of, of people who worked very, who had deep friendships and also worked, worked on the bird. And it wasn't like en masse everybody <laughs> that that cohort was superseded by by a new cohort. Right. I do right. think there was that there is something of just and I don't know if it's generationally, but that that folks did sort of transition to other things um, sort of at the same time. And 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 knowing that you were living with Tom and Stephanie and Doyle. Right, exactly. And, yeah. And talking about the eating co op. <laughs> And, thing, and it yeah. and Doyle worked full time for the bird. Mm hmm. Yeah. But correct me that, that it that it. I suspect that in a close community like that, that as other people are, that this is becoming less a central focus of of their lives, and your life is also continuing on that that would come into play that other, you know, it's just not as central in, in that. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about the times and I, I'm, I think that I was um, getting more engaged in the, well, I think we did not start Southern Exposure uh, at the Institute initially we started at we started it later after bob all arrived so i imagine that part of my not being as engaged in the bird had to do with southern exposure although as i said there was certainly overlap in stories that were published in southern exposure and the bird but i wasn't as involved on on a daily basis or in the co-op i think uh in those later in the maybe by 72 73 and there i would have been more focused on building up uh southern exposure and the institute mm -hmm. although i would i did go back and look for the first dates uh i had i had not been clear about the date of the first issue of southern exposure and I think that the first issue of Southern Exposure would have either been late 1973 or early 1974. Uh, the No More Moaning issue, for instance, is uh, called Winter 1974. And I distinctly, we, we, we were never successful at publishing Southern Exposure on a three month calendar. We were uh, all generally late. Um, and and as so as Bob says, we can manipulate the seasons easier than we can manipulate the dates. <laughs> so we went to we called them uh, summer or fall or so forth. Um, but the no more money issue was the uh, uh, winter of 1974. Um, so I think the the issue on defense spending would have been published in early 1974 or late 1973. And I. I, for some reason, I couldn't find that a copy of that issue. I think I have it, but I, I couldn't put my hands on it. But yes, I would think that my involvement with the bird is definitely related to uh, my paying job, which was the Institute for Southern Studies. Yeah. And, and, and focusing on building that as an institution. Mm -hmm. But as you say, I'm, I'm living with half the bird staff. So. Yeah, but I, I think I, I recall that when probably around the time that Bob moves to Atlanta and, and things pick up a lot with uh, conceiving the idea of Southern exposure, right. you know, 
Tom and Stephanie at that point have two kids. Tom, I think, is is soon moving to starting up the trucking business. Right, right. I don't know if Howard at that point had, you know. Howard was full time at the Institute by that stage. Yeah, and then would have been moving back to Louisiana. And yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people, their, their lives butted up against new developments that necessitated. Yeah. yeah new things well i i actually think that that's a lot of what i wanted to ask about the bird if you if you have anything to add about that um about anything other other stories you'd like to relate no i don't have any stories and but i i do want to just um uh, because in a lot of your questioning i'm realizing that i i wasn't I, I was not so central to the bird, but I do want to just state for the record, uh, the bird looms large in my life. I mean, I'm, it's, it's, I, I'm very proud that I was a part of it to the extent that I was a part of it. Uh, I, I, I think the bird, and I said this earlier, I think it rapidly developed a reputation as being one of the best underground papers in the country. And I think history's, it's kept that, I think it's kept that reputation, historically even, which is, I think, a, a little bit unusual. But so I, um, and that being a part of that creative time in Atlanta, and a part of that community in Atlanta that was creating that institution was, was a very important time for me. I was very happy to be a part of it. And can you talk about, uh, related to, to this, can you speak um, about the relationships that you formed at that time and how they have continued how you reflect on them, you know, now 50, 50 years later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I just had a conversation two nights ago with Zachary Coffin. Uh, and when in one of the uh, last interviews, I was, I was talking about him as a toe-headed baby, essentially. Um, and so those, those relationships have remained. Uh, uh, a central part of my life, uh, both uh, the, the Tom and Stephanie Coffin and uh, their two children, Simon and Zachary, uh, very much a part of my life and their children um, are a part of my life. And uh, Jean Guerrero, Howard Romaine, uh, those people are still very much touchstones for me. Um, Jean and I communicate regularly about, very often about country music or politics or whatever, but we stay in touch um, and, 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 and make an attempt. I, I think we've been good over the years about finding a way to, to really not just stay in touch, but to see each other and to be a part of each other's lives. Um, Jean's daughter got married a couple of years ago and I was not able to go to the wedding because of my situation with my my sister being ill and in the hospital. Um, and that was a, you know, that was a, an event that I wouldn't have missed had I been able to go. So we have stayed in touch and I stay in touch with Doyle Neiman as well. Um, not as much as some of the others, but we do get together and, and are stay in touch. Becky Hamilton, uh, you know, I, I drove to Atlanta from Nashville in a driving rainstorm last year, last October, I think, or maybe it was the October before, uh, to have a, but I think it was just this past October, uh, for a, a reunion of the bird uh, that was held at Becky's daughter's house in Atlanta. And I made every effort to get there because those were people that I wanted to see and be with. Um, and there was discussion of starting up a new bird at that at that meeting. I didn't see you there, which I was sorry, but uh, it was, um, you know, it's a, it's a community that uh, 
definitely a part of my life for all of these years. And how do you think back to that period of time, if you could summarize what that, that era meant or continues to mean? Well, I, I think one of the reasons those friendships have have remained solid and core. Uh, uh, those are core friendships. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that we were all engaged in doing something that we deeply believed in. And, you know, this, uh, I, I don't want to say it's, I could say we thought we were changing the world. I don't think even then we thought we were changing the world. But I do think we thought we were doing something that was important and that we were creating change. And so I think to act on those, you know, we, on those core principles of what you thought was right and wrong and what needed to be done, that's a solid basis for friendship and community. And I think that's one of the reasons um, that we have maintained these relationships and these friendships over the years. We were doing something that we all considered very important and of consequence uh, in terms of how we lived in the world and what we thought the world should look like and be. Um, and I think that's important. It wasn't a job. It wasn't a job that we were doing for a salary. We weren't, most of us weren't getting a salary, but it was something that we believed in and worked for. And I think we thought at the time, I think we knew we were creating community. I think that was also a part of it, um, that we were creating community that, um, I don't know that we thought about how long it would last, but I think we did, we were conscious that we were creating community at the time. And that was very reminiscent of the civil rights movement, which talked about the creating the beloved community. So it was, uh, to me, those were all of a piece of being in community and working, working for something that you believed in with people who uh, were right there with you. Mm -hmm. I don't think, um, the stakes were not as high in terms of the work we were doing on the bird as it had been in Mississippi summer, for instance, but there was still, uh, there was sense, there was still that sense of, of, of making change and making waves and creating something new. And what, just to be very specific, what was the change? What are examples of the change you wanted? Where, where, where would that change be directed? I think we wanted the Vietnam War to end. I think we wanted uh, segregation and discrimination to end. Uh, I think we wanted uh, someone, politics, international relationships, to be more democratic, uh, to, to not be the United States using, using its clout around the world in the way that it was using it at the time. Um, so I think uh, all of those, you, you know, they could be, fr I, I think are framed as our political worldview, really, is what we were working on, but also a, a more about how people lived out their daily lives with each other uh, in terms of respect for individuals regardless of race, color, creed, etc. Uh, sexual orientation. Um, and, and, and then just to admit it, we were also having a lot of fun. It was fun. Yeah. 
And what what did that what did that fun look like? What, I I have a a question here of <laughs> which a lot of people often laugh at because I ask what did you do for relaxation and recuperation during that time? And people are like, or, or maybe I even say like during your time off <laughs> and people are like, time off, <laughs> who knows about things like that? Um, well, I, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, I, we, at some point we started going to Grayton beach. That was a great getaway and, uh, reasonable from Atlanta, but, uh, we didn't have a lot of money, I mean, to do things like that in, in, in the early 70s, I don't think. But I think we spent time with each other and we developed things like the eating co-op so that we could actually enjoy each other, enjoy each other's company and be with each other and also help each other manage daily living. Um, it was economically smart to do the eating co-op it was certainly smart in terms of organization of time. I mean, think about it. If you don't have to think about putting dinner on the table seven nights out of eight, that frees up a lot of time and energy. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a very smart thing to do. Oh, but it all. also meant that we enjoyed each other's company and we could, and it was easy to come and go from if you had a conflict no big deal. You just didn't show up that night. So I think we created ways um, uh, to, quote, spend our downtime. But, um, and I, I recall, uh, you know, the, the women, <laughs> the women in the Bird, several women, a lot of women in the Bird Women's Caucus in Atlanta Women's Liberation, we went through a, a phase of crocheting like crazy. I mean, I never... I'm not at all craft oriented. I don't, uh, uh, you know, I tried knitting one time and the idea of doing, um, making two hands do something in sync was way beyond me. But, uh, you know, there was one Christmas when I crocheted scarves for everybody in my family and then I suddenly quit crocheting and haven't done it for years, have no interest in doing it whatever. But at that time in Atlanta, I think because we were spending so much time in meetings, we figured out a way to, to make the meetings uh, go a little bit faster if we crocheted and made, made gifts for people. So we would, you know, we created things. We were creative uh, about the way we did it. Mm -hmm. And there were all, always concerts to go to and music to listen to. That was also uh, great. Atlanta had the great Southeast Music Hall. And actually I did a lot of interviews about artists who came, or interviews and then articles for the bird uh, uh, with performers who came to the great Southeast Music Hall and met, met a lot of performers doing that. I think I interviewed, I know I interviewed Lily Tomlin uh, at the Great Southeast Music Hall, and I think that ended up being an article in The Bird. Um, and Steve Young, other people who came to the Great Southeast Music Hall. Where was that located? I think it was somewhere close. It wasn't in Ansley Mall, but I think it was... I don't remember exactly, but I, somehow or other, I think it was over there in that general area. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fabulous music venue that didn't last a long time, but it brought phenomenal performers to Atlanta. People like Steve Martin, Lily Tomlin, uh, other less well-known people came um, as well. And because we had passes, Bird, we could, we could get in and interview those performers and talk to them in the, the green room before they went on or afterward. Um, so <clears throat> it was a great source of, of articles for the bird. Well, now that we've covered, covered the bird, which- I know, I don't think I have one more thing to say about the bird. <laughs> well, in 
there's still a lot of uh, life to discuss. Um, yeah. So you know, things might might crop back up. If you're if you still have the energy, I'd like to explore a little bit about um, Atlanta's women Atlanta women's liberation. Okay, we can do. Uh, I I. Yes, I would like to say a little bit more about that, although it, it's fuzzy, I have to say. I will admit right up front, it's fuzzy. But we should talk a little bit more about that and then maybe uh, go into Highlander uh, after about leaving and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I need to take a break, though. Can we do that? I don't have to be, I, I can do it in two minutes and be right back. Yeah, that's. I, I'd love to take a, a, a little break as well. Um, and maybe we can just let the camera roll, or do you think that I'd... I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, see I'm going to turn my video off, but we'll. I think it, it will keep rolling, right? Oh, now I'll do the same, but I'll see you in yeah. just a minute or two. Okay, great.
Cheers. Yeah. Cheers to that. That looks delicious. I took my morning coffee and put ice in it. So now I'm drinking iced coffee. Yeah, nice transition to, to, to mark the afternoon. So Atlanta Women's Liberation. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious and, and you know, this is not the, the central focus of all of these great speckled bird oral history interviews, but the bit of research that I've done on, on Atlanta during this time, there are, are references made to Atlanta, Atlanta Women's Liberation. And I know that there's a fair amount of overlap with people that participated in the bird, but information is scant. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm curious about anything that anybody remembers, just where it came from, who was involved in it, what, how often did it meet, where did it meet, uh, what was discussed, what did it mean to people, all of that. <laughs> um, well, I, I have talked a little bit about it, so I'll try not to repeat myself, which I tend to do. Um, but it was, uh, it was, Atlanta Women's Liberation was a consciousness raising group. It didn't, <clears throat> I don't know that people used that term so much then, but that's definitely what it was. It was a time where uh, women came together and actually talked deeply uh, over over time, you begin to trust people enough that you talk deeply about uh, gender issues. Excuse me. <coughs> and so that was the first time that I had been uh, involved in that kind of group. And as I said earlier, it was very important to me. And I think it was because of this, um, I think literally it did raise my consciousness about women's issues and about gender issues, which I had been reluctant to put in the foreground uh, before that. And uh, being, a, being a member of this group at that particular time gave me permission to do that and to really think about my own life and to think about my relationships, especially my work relationships, um, in, in terms of gender. Um, and so we met, uh, it was a, I don't know how it was organized. Um, I know that Nan was a part of it and may have been the one who invited me to come. Um, we met, I believe, I don't know that we met once a week, but we met pretty consistently, uh, maybe once a month, maybe more. Uh, it feels to me like we've met more than that. And we met in people's houses um, and we would sit around in a circle and just talk. And sometimes we would talk about what someone needed to talk about. And, and that could be what was happening at work for somebody or what was happening in a relationship for somebody. Um, and we supported each other and, um, and bared our souls with each other. Uh, something very new the you know, in all of the organizations I worked for, this was not, um, not a part of it. And I, I'm sure that I said in an earlier interview, there had been, um, I had bumped up against uh, women's groups in Washington, DC, but didn't feel that they were, uh, that I didn't feel that they had a whole lot to do with me, but I felt like in Atlanta, with Atlanta Women's Liberation, I really did, um, come to a new consciousness about women's issues. And uh, I don't know how long this lasted. It seems to me at least a year that I was a part of this, maybe more, um, but terribly, terribly um, uh, foundational for me uh, in terms, I, I, I was not the same afterward. 
uh, let me just say it bluntly, uh, being a part of that group actually made me uh, a feminist and gave me a feminist consciousness that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And, um, became, and it became a part of who I was forever after um, that. Which, you know, I went on to, you know, I definitely, and, and it was a part of the time. I mean, it was a part of the time of the writings about uh, sisterhood and gender issues and uh, uh, in many ways an extension of the Bird Women's Caucus, which also had some of the same flavor to it in terms of people talking openly and honestly about their feelings. Um, but it just was uh, very foundational for me uh, and very important for me. I don't remember, uh, I remember that the group had, um, as I recall, we were usually 10 to 12 to maybe even 15 people um, in, a, in, in a group, uh, not always there all the time, uh, and that it included uh, people who weren't a part of the Bird Caucus, for instance. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just my immediate political community. I met people in there that I didn't know from other places, new, new, new faces, new names, uh, and became friendly with. Um, but many of them I did overlap with in one way or another as well. So, I, and I don't have a lot more to say about it, except it was, I mean, I think the important thing for me is that it was a consciousness raising group um, that that really did change me. Mm. Do you know what about what years this might have been? Uh, well, I think it would have been. Um, I think it would have been 70, 71, 72, uh, somewhere in the early 70s. Yeah. I would put it in there. It, um, about, it, I would say uh, about the same time as my active involvement in the bird. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, you know, that that there were additional literature coming out at this time, readings and, and sisterhood and all that. Do you recall if you, if you, you all read things together or? I don't recall that we read a book together. I think we talked about articles maybe or talked about books that were out there, but it wasn't like a book club where everybody would read the same book. Yeah. But we did talk about certain things. And I'm, my guess is that we were reporting on a lot of this, a lot of the women's writings in the bird at this time as well. I'd have to look at those particular issues, but we were in touch with what was, uh, we were in touch with what was going on nationally in terms of this, but the focus of the group was on ourselves. I mean, it was you know, I, definitely consciousness raising is a, is a good term here because it was deeply personal, deeply honest, and deeply life-changing. And do you think, to that point, that it w certainly was not a reading group, and and previously you you've mentioned how you were not enthralled with with the feminist mystique uh, yeah. <laughs> at I, this time. I felt well, a little when I was listening to myself that I was a little unfair to Betty for Dan. <laughs> I don't, I don't and, think. And, it was dismissive. It was just for you that didn't. It, it didn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. But a simple work, but it didn't work for me at the time. Do you recall any any books coming out subsequently five five ten years later that did more click? Uh, yes, and we were like 
the book Sisterhood is powerful. Um, blanking on the author right now. Um, most of those books that were coming out during that time, we either came up in the Bird Women's Caucus or were talked about. We, you know, we were aware of those things. Um, may have been reviewed in the Great Speckled Bird, for instance. Um, so we were definitely aware of. I don't know what to say beyond that, really. Yeah. yeah. And do you know, I, I thought that I had come across something at some point, and I, I could be mistaken, but I've seen or heard reference to an actual physical location, an office, like a house. I think, you know, sort of like Moreland, Briarcliff, Ponce de Leon, that area that I, that I think was some sort of women's. I think you're right. I, think I, it was I, I, I remember that place. as well. Yes, I think you're right. I remember that as well. Um, and I remember we actually had a retreat, an all day retreat at that house one time. Um, one of the women who was involved uh, became a yoga instructor uh, was, and I think was in the process of leaving her husband as we started. Um, someone not engaged in the progressive community uh, that I knew of at least, uh, someone from maybe the Buckhead area or you know, more suburban Atlanta who uh, really changed her life uh, became a yoga instructor, I think later had a woman partner. Uh, but, and I don't think that that was that unusual a story at the time. Mm. Uh, but I remember she was a part of the group and I remember uh, being at a meeting with her at this house. So I think you're right, there was a house, but I do also remember other meetings in people's homes or apartments um, that we would go to. I don't know how long we were able to keep that house, um, but our, 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 I don't remember a lot about it. Yeah. A lot of things were ephemeral. Yes. Well, it's, you know, I have a very aged memory at this time. <laughs> In terms of, of composition of participants, how would you describe you just mentioned that, you know, there was this woman who was not sort of part of your usual circles that you traveled in. Um, but just generally speaking, how would you describe the, the women that participated? Uh, very much of a cross section. I, sir, I would say that half of the women were people that I maybe already knew or overlapped with in some way. Uh, um, but other, other women I was meeting for the first time who had jobs in downtown Atlanta or who lived in, like this woman lived in, in this, uh, what I call the suburbs. I don't think she lived that far out. But um, a cross section of women coming together. And I don't know, I, I really don't know, I would like to know about the origins and maybe I'll talk to Nan about this next time I see her or talk with her, if she remembers the origins of it. Um, I, I don't know who maybe called the first meeting, for instance, um, but um, I'm grateful to whoever did, for sure. I think Ann Monty was also pretty involved. Ann Monty was a part of it, yes. And I haven't had a chance to interview her, but yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah. That, um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking that that retreat may have been in Ann Monty's house, not some other house that was in an Atlanta Women's Liberation House. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know we, we, we did meet in different places. And you mentioned the, the woman who potentially 
got divorced from her husband and ultimately had a relationship with another woman. Was there a fair amount of that in the, within women's liber liberation, as you recall, the people exploring or questioning their sexuality or actually coming out? I wouldn't say there was a fair amount, but it, it was, but it was definitely happening. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a collective, which I'm sure has come up in other interviews with you, uh, called Ruby Fruit Jungle, which in, in, in included some of the women who were close to the bird. And uh, I think people were definitely exploring uh, same-sex relationships there. And um, I met a good friend during that time who moved there from Atlanta. I mean, uh, excuse me, who moved there from North Carolina, I think, who came to Atlanta and lived in the Ruby Fruit Jungle House. And I think I initially met, met her because she was going on the Vince Ramos Brigade. I'm not sure how we initially met, but became a good friend. But she was a part of the Ruby Fruit Jungle House and she became uh, developed um, a, a relationship with another woman and remain has, you know, she has lived in Germany for the past 30 years with her partner there. Um, and we've stayed in loose touch uh, because partly because I know her sister who lives in the Knoxville area. But uh, so it was beginning to happen. I think people were beginning to explore and, and, and um, come to terms with their sexuality or uh, either make a decision that they wanted to be in a same-sex relationship. And what about um, the sameness or difference along race and class lines within, within the group? I think it was all white. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was all white. And I would describe it as all middle class in the sense that we were all educated. Uh, I don't know that we all... I've never considered myself as coming from the middle class, but by that point I had an education. I had a degree, a college degree, and enough privilege to choose the lifestyle um, I wanted. Um, so I would describe it as middle class and white. I don't know that there was anything equivalent um, and the black community at the time. It, I, just to add, I, I think we were middle class and white and ironically in a consciousness raising group, unconscious of that fact. Mm. Does that make sense? I, we, we were, We were changing our own lives, but not aware of the privilege that we had, uh, which, which of course is a part of the uh, women's liberation story. And were you in touch? I know that in previous interviews you uh, at least made made reference to like Casey Hayden. Um, who features pretty prominently in in this era of both civil rights and 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 feminist consciousness and activism. Do you do you recall whether you know this personal work that you were doing and specifically in Atlanta women's liberation were conversations with, you know, longtime friends that you had had, you know, from SNCC or SOC. Um, were other people, in, you know, coming up against the same, these same dynamics and, and doing this similar work? And were you all sharing that? Um, I, for me, no, not beyond, uh, not beyond 
my community in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Casey had, um, I'll, I'll talk later about the book uh, that we did together called uh, the, um, Deep in Our Hearts, uh, which Casey was a part of. And we talked a lot about the memo that Casey co-authored. Uh, with Mary King, although it turns out there were other authors uh, to that statement as well. Uh, in, in our meetings to develop the book, Deep in Our Hearts, uh, we talked a lot about that, that memo that came out of SNCC that was so, that's so well known. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people talked, uh, the pe one of the people who had written, uh, two of the people who had been involved in the meeting that that uh, came out of, talked about it specifically and um, you know the agreement there was that people everybody no, no one no one who wrote it or authored it I think had any bad feelings towards Stokely Carmichael who's been maligned because of his response to it uh, but everybody understood it understood Stokely's comment differently um, and um, not as a more as Stoke regular Stokely humor than anything else, so we're not offended by his response to it, which I thought was which I which rang true to me, having known Stokely as well, because Stokely was terribly funny uh, and very quick witted and would would have made that kind of statement, whether or not it was offensive or not. You could uh, you could imagine Stokely making it. And the, um, the comment being that women's position in SNCC was right. The, yeah. right. The, the title of the article was The Position of Women in SNCC. And Stokely's quick wit said, oh, it's just, it's prone. And meant as a joke, not as a, not as a serious response to the, um, to the document, I think. And uh, my guess is that Stokely was smart enough to take that document very seriously. Um, and, and probably over time did, uh, but he's remembered for his response to it. But it reminded me, Stokely's response, and I'll just say this now, uh, Stokely's response reminds me of a quip by Miles Horton later at Highlander. And here you have the, the founder of the, you know, Highlander Folk School, Highlander Research and Education Center. Um, I had been a part of a, a, a a group of women at Highlander who had met over, had had a weekend retreat and met and had a, a, a very much like a caucus, I suppose, and then reported out to the, to the board uh, their thoughts about the meeting. And so, um, what was it? It was called the, the in-house, I in, uh, hyphen house report from the women was the title was the way the, the way this report was referred to when it came up at the board meeting and so this in-house report Miles Horton sitting in a big group of people uh, probably the same way Stokely did said oh I thought you meant hen house report and you know there was a gasp by everybody in the room who couldn't believe he had been so politically incorrect, <laughs> and um, and you know it was uh, he was you know he just was at that time, um, and it was not something I think he would should have been proud of, but it was it was just it it was. Uh, his way of cutting through the tension in the room, I suppose. Or with Miles, you never knew. Miles thought that conflict was good and that education came out of it. So he may have been intending to increase the tension in the room for all I know. But it, re those, it reminded me of Stokely's comment uh, regarding the Smith paper. Uh, I can talk more about that, but I'd like to do it when we talk about the book, Deep in Our Hearts. Yes, yes. In talking about Atlanta women's liberation, you talked about how foundational it was and how it changed you. Can you elaborate in 
just how it changed or shifted your foundation? Well, I think I had, I had been so, the civil rights movement was so important to me in, in a, in, in a life-changing way. Um, I felt like those years in Nashville really shaped who I became as a person and, and where I put my energy and work for the rest of my life, not just for a year or two, but for the rest of my life. Uh, I was shaped by that moment in Nashville in the early 60s and became committed to something that went beyond myself, I think. So, and was always, have always been deeply grateful that I became a part of that community uh, of, of not just the Nashville community, but the, the freedom community, the Mississippi 64, SNCC, SOC, et cetera, anybody who was working on behalf of civil rights, that what, what Jim Foreman referred to as Band of Brothers Circle of Trust and what John Lewis referred to as the beloved community. Um, I mean, I, that, was, that was my home um, in, in many ways. That's, that was my touchstone. And I put, I had always prioritized uh, those issues that had to do with race. Um, and, and, and I don't think that was a mistake on my part to do that, but in, but I think Atlanta Women's Liberation provided me with the space to actually think about more personal issues around gender, which I had, which I had thought before were, um, taking space and energy and time from focusing on race. And I felt like Atlanta Women's Liberation uh, at that point that it didn't have to be something that took away, but something that added to the conversation. And that something uh, that was past time in terms of, because I had had too many instances myself of being a woman in a, both work and personal situations where I needed a place to talk to about those things and about what, what was real sexism and patriarch. You know, we were in, we were in a patriarchal society and the, the movement was no different. Um, and so it was, uh, it provided a way to actually begin to honestly think about those things. And it, um, and, and I, I, and, I think it took as much courage to do that as it as it did to um, step out and take a position as a white southerner about race in some ways. I think it took courage to, even in the early 70s to, to actually deal straight up with gender issues and to say, no, you will not treat me this way or that, you know, that is sexist behavior um, because it meant you were you were bumping up against something and you were an outlier for doing things like that. So, uh, but I do feel that, uh, I don't know why, um, I think it may have been the, the zeitgeist of the time, but uh, I, I did, you know, for whatever reason, I felt uh, able in Atlanta to think about gender as, as something that was important to deal with and that it did not have to take away from my commitment uh, to working on issues of freedom and, and equality and so forth, but that it was genuinely important to do that. And uh, so I think it just added uh, a level of consciousness to my work um, and, and, and helped me think, it, it expanded my knowledge really of how, how to think about injustice and and discrimination um, uh, while still thinking, um, continuing to think about um, other issues as well. But I, I do think that it, um, when I say it was again found foundational, um, it, 
once once I did spend the time doing that, it it became as much a part of me as the uh, being a part of the freedom movement uh, in Nashville had. I hope that makes some sense. Yes. And you say that it took you a bit of time to come to come to this realization um, and and be open to it. Was that was that something conscious on your part or a a, a struggle or ambivalence? Like saying, you know, from the mid '60s until this early '70s, that other people had been doing it and you had some resistance that you thought that it was. I don't know if you used the word distraction, but at uh -huh. least in terms of priorities. Priorities, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, I, I think my earlier glances, you know, when I sort of glanced off of the women's movement, um, I had found that um, the timing just wasn't right for me, and 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 DC, um, and I had enormous respect for the women uh, who were involved in the women's movement there. Uh, once remained a lifelong friend. Uh, but I did feel it was, um, I, I was very aware of the class issues involved in it and felt like it was, it was coming almost from a place of privilege um, More than, and I and I and I could only see that part of it, rather than being able to see and appreciate the personal struggle that people were were going through with it, and the personal um, consciousness and knowledge that people were gaining as a result of being involved in the in the women's movement. So I didn't see that part of it as much as I saw. Um, something that I thought was um, not a high priority in terms of the political issues that needed to be worked on and that were taking away from the uh, uh, space and time needed to be devoted to the civil rights movement, essentially. Um, and, it, and I also felt like it was women speaking for other women uh, in terms of the class issue. And that uh, put me off a little bit. But uh, that was uh, the consciousness raising groups, and I didn't. And and I'm sure that if I explored it more, I would have found out that the consciousness raising groups were in fact something different. Um, and but I did not either find time or was not in the right place to do that until Atlanta, until this opportunity to be a part of Atlanta Women's Liberation, and it certainly felt like the right time. Uh, there. But I, I came, I, I came to it slowly, I think, and um, I think um, it, I don't, I mean, when I commit to doing something, I commit to doing it, um, but I don't, I'm not one who jumps in, um, I mean, I was, I had the same uh, reluctance in many ways about getting involved in the civil rights movement. I was, I didn't, it was, it, it, it takes, all of these things take you out of your safe place. They're not, they're not safe in terms of the new ground that you're asked to prod, either in terms of uh, the early days of the civil rights movement of making making a commitment about race and getting involved in a, a direct action movement or in terms of, of, of uh, questioning people's um, behaviors and thoughts about gender issues. Th those aren't safe places to be. So you have to edge up to them and find a place where you can enter uh, to, be, to become fully committed to them, I think. And, you know, Nashville was the place for me in terms of the, of the civil rights movement, and Atlanta was the place for me in terms of the women's movement.
Mm. And in talking about this, you had, you said something to the effect of like, coming into feminism or understanding feminism, how would you describe, describe what feminism was to you at that time? Um. I don't know that I could honestly describe what it was at that time uh, because it's just, I'd, I'd have to go through so many layers of how I think about it now mm -hmm. uh, um, to get back there. Um, I think I would have been reluctant even I think at that point I would have been reluctant to use the term feminist, for instance, uh, because it was an inflammatory word um, then. Um, but I also was um, needed uh, needed uh, the space that Atlanta Women's Liberation provided in terms of the consciousness raising. So I was, I was personally ready and needing that space and knew that and, um, and found it a safe place to talk and work out things. And that, you know, that was very important. I think across the country, those groups were terribly important in terms of the space they provided women to actually talk about things that they couldn't talk about in, in mixed groups or in, with women, with even maybe in a group of women that weren't uh, about that. So um, that sort of safe place, I think, gave people, gave me and other women um, the space we needed to actually uh, come to terms with some of our own thinking and our own hurts. And, uh, and, and of course, when you're doing that with other women, then you realize that that wasn't just, it wasn't just you that that happened to, or that it was a common practice and that it was not the right thing and that it needed to be changed. So you get, it, it gave you that sense of collectivity at the same time you were dealing with very personal issues are coming at least from a very personal place uh, and, and being able to, to recognize, um, you know, the stories were familiar. There's a, there was a familiarity in the stories that people were telling each other about their treatment or about harassment or whatever. Um, so it, it, made sense things begin to fall into place i think in those kind of settings did you talk with your mom or your sisters at all about this over over the years how important that was to you or just try to share that with them. I know that you say how grateful you were to your mom that, yeah. that she never instilled, you know, the domestic priority right. in you and how much she prioritized, you know, outside work. Yeah, um, yeah. Public I, don't work. That I, I don't think I ever had a conversation about feminism with, with that I would have named it and, talked about women's issues, but I never, once I got engaged in something, I, I, I was, I never, I, it, it was a part of my life and I didn't hide it or um, shy away from it. So I know that when I would come home and have conversations 
it, it would be reflected in my actions or how I responded at the dinner table or whatever. Um, and um, so it, it, it wasn't something, um, you know, my, my thoughts about women in general were, would have been well known to members of my family, uh, uh, any, both mother and sister and anybody else. I did do, at one point I did, um, I did some interviews with my mother um, to uh, try and understand her life. And, and I, don't, I don't know the exact dates of those interviews and I've never actually transcribed those interviews. Um, but I did uh, try to uh, figure out what her life had been like in terms of growing up in a rural area, uh, marrying, fairly young, having a family, getting to work outside the home and so forth. And, um, and I also later did a series of interviews with my sister as well. Um, but I wasn't able in the, I felt like uh, the, in the ones with my sister, I wasn't able to elicit as much information as I would have liked uh, to do. I still have those interviews and I haven't done anything with them, but um, so we didn't necessarily talk. All of this is to say, we, I didn't sit down and have a conversation with them about <coughs> my growing consciousness around feminism, but I would have, it would have been an ongoing part of the, of whatever conversation we were having in terms of my outspokenness about things. <coughs> I need to switch to water. I've got a scratchy throat. <coughs> what do you think? Should we start on Highlander today or hold it? How are you feeling? I'm okay. I'm okay for a little while longer if you want to uh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and maybe depending on how much... I, wa I, want to, I want to talk about, number one, I know that at some point the Institute for Southern Studies was operating out of both Atlanta and Durham. Right, and, yes. And why it was that they how the decision came that the Atlanta office would shut down and everything would move to Durham. So I'm curious about that. And then in 1977, I think, you leave Atlanta and move to Durham to attend uh, Duke's oral history program? Uh, you have some sort uh, of fellowship. Yeah, uh, not to attend the, no, I wasn't a student at Duke. I, I, I don't know whether it was a, it was a fellowship at Duke um, that allowed me to go work on the interviews uh, on a set of interviews I had done. So I can, I can come, you want me to just go into that now? Yeah, if we can. That would be a good way of wrapping up the morning actually. Um, yeah, the, the transition out of Atlanta, yeah, yeah, both you yeah. and Southern Studies. Uh, I had gone, um, when we started doing the oral history interviews at, um, at the Institute for Southern Studies, one of the people involved in the early days was Jacqueline Hall, who at that time was married to Bob Hall. Um, and Jacqueline, Leah, and I had been the three uh, people uh, engaged in doing the oral history. I had sort of lobbied for a project that would do that and Leah and Jack and both of them were quite interested and the three of us uh, created a little cabal within the institute to begin working on that and wrote proposals for which we never I don't think we ever got any funding and but we just did it I I, I don't know we must use <laughs> borrow general funds or something to do it but Jackie was finishing her dissertation from Columbia University at the time. 
uh, and, and writing a book, which later became uh, an award-winning book on Jesse Daniel Ames, the woman who opposed lynching in the South. Um, so, but she was, uh, I think, uh, doing the research at that point in Atlanta where the Ames papers were and so which is why Bob had come to Atlanta. Uh, but because we the three of us got involved in doing this oral history, Jackie applied for a position at the University of North Carolina to become the director of this of the Southern Oral History Program, the first director of the Southern Oral History Program at UNC. And she was accepted. Uh, she got that position. And she and Bob moved to North Carolina at that time. Uh, and we kept, to, and Bob started working out of his house, uh, stayed, stayed with the Institute in Southern Exposure and working out of his house uh, in, in uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, and I believe Chip Hughes maybe moved, I'm not quite sure why Chip moved to Durham, but he did, um, and he and Chip worked together over there. Um, but Jacqueline asked me, uh, after she became the director of the Southern Oral History Program, she asked me to go do an interview with, um, with Virginia Durer. Um, I'm trying to think now if it was just Virginia at the time or with Virginia and Clifford Durer, but I think it was just Virginia Durer in, in Montgomery, Alabama. And just a quick, uh, for anybody listening to this, uh, Virginia and Clifford Durer were, uh, were activists who had were progressives from Montgomery, Alabama, both of them Alabamians who had worked in the Roosevelt administration. Clifford had been on the Federal Communications Commission under Roosevelt and a lawyer. And Virginia had been uh, very involved in the Henry Wallace campaign and in the Southern Conference for Human Welfare and had been one of the people hauled up before the Eastland Committee for Un-American Activities when Miles and several other Southern progressives had been called before that committee. So, and they had, uh, Cliff, Clifford Durr was one of the lawyers along with Fred Gray who went down to get Rosa Parks out of jail in 1955. So the Durrs had a, a long history of progressive involvement uh, in, in, uh, in Alabama and in the country. And so I, Jackie asked me if I would uh, help her. I think we either do an interview with Virginia or help her do an interview. And I know I did one interview by myself and then I did another interview with Jackie, uh, with Virginia for the Southern Oral History Program. And, and that remains in, in the, that's a part of the Southern Oral History Program collection, that interview. But, so I got to know Virginia and Cliff, Cliff was still living. I got to know them, or, or maybe I had known them before this, I'm not sure, um, but I did know both of them well before Cliff died. But after Cliff died, uh, Virginia got very interested in doing a book. And she, because she remembered doing this interview with me, Virginia and I had hit it off, I really liked her a lot and we were very at ease with each other. Uh, Virginia asked me if I would come and help her uh, interview her and use those interviews as a basis for this book that she wanted to write. And so that's when I started going from Atlanta to Montgomery for extended periods of time, uh, weeks at a time, and, and doing a series, a long series of, in, of interviews with Virginia I think there's probably at least maybe 20 to 30 hours of interview uh, that we did together. Uh, and these were to be the basis for her book. And so Virginia and I both love to talk more than we like to write or edit. And we did the interviews. And then um, 
and she wanted me to do a first edit, not to write the book, but to do a first edit of the interviews. And I had said that I would have her do that. And so uh, do, uh, Jackie was at UNC, we're starting the oral history program. Um, Bill Chafe and Larry Goodwin had started an oral history program at Duke a little earlier. And they had, um, I think they were called fellowships where you could apply and come and do work on oral history. And I applied, um, I remember writing the letter about and talking about these interviews with Virginia and I applied to go there and spend a year knowing that I could both work with the Southern Exposure there and continue to do work on the interviews. And so I was given this fellowship at the Duke Oral History Program. And that was 1977, 78, uh, I think. Um, and so I went over to Duke, uh, shared a house with uh, Chip Hughes and Lynn Stanley, who were living together at the time, later married, um, and, uh, and worked a little bit, uh, spent some time working with the Southern Exposure crew over there, the ISS. But I was the only one. Leah had gone to work with, Leah had entered graduate school at Duke, I think, by this time. Yes, Leah had, Leah had gone to get a, a graduate degree from Duke. So she had moved to Durham by this time. And I was the only one in the Atlanta office. So it did not make sense to keep an Atlanta office um, of Southern Exposure. And uh, Bob, uh, there, were, there were staff added in Durham. So the, the Durham staff was building. And so we shut the office down in 77, I think. Um, and I went to uh, spend that year in Durham. Um, to work on these interviews with Virginia Foster Durer uh, and, and worked on them. I had, um, I'll just go ahead with that story because uh, that, I can't remember, I know that we were, I did some work uh, for the Institute in Southern Exposure, but really I was in and out because I was mainly focused around Duke. Um, but I worked hard on editing these interviews with Virginia, but I was, way too close to them and too close to Virginia um, and uh, was having a lot of trouble uh, figuring out how to to craft a book that was her biography uh, was her autobiography and and maintain I, I didn't think it could be just her voice from the interview so much so I ended up getting stuck uh, and that writing. Um, and then in the fall, I, but I had also gotten much more engaged with the Highlander Center by this time by being a member of the, not, I was a member of their resource committee, I think, and at some point became a member of their board. So, and I had spent a summer at Highlander um, prior to going to Durham. Uh, I, I had spent six weeks staying at the Guy, Guy and Candy Carawan's cabin there. Uh, so I was uh, getting to know all of the Highlander staff and, and so forth during this time. And um, I guess the long and short of this story is that I, I ended up, Highlander got a grant to do its archives and offered me a position in the fall of 78. So I left, when I, once I finished the year at Duke, I went directly to Highlander. And I had not, the, the book was nowhere near being done at that point. Um, and I kept trying to work on it part-time, but Virginia eventually said, I need somebody to work on this book with me and began working with another woman uh, there in Montgomery. And the book did eventually come out based on these interviews that we had done. Um, uh, Hollinger Bernard I, is the name of the woman who uh, eventually helped her bring that book out. And it's called Outside the Magic Circle. Um, uh, and it was her autobiography and got quite a bit of attention when it came out. 
but I was not able to finish it with her because I was terribly, by that time I was deeply engaged at Highlander uh, and in, in the work there uh, with her. But it was that set of interviews that sent me uh, to Duke and to the year at Duke, which was a fabulous year of being there. Um, and, then, um, and then on to Highlander after that. So I think that answers both of your questions about shutting down the Institute and, and the year spent at Duke. Yes, uh, a few follow-ups, of course. Um, I don't think that I ever uh, really understood. So when Jackie and Bob moved to Atlanta, largely for her to be doing work on her dissertation research. That's right and Bob comes into the Institute for Southern Studies. Did you all know each other before? How did he get folded in or learn about the Institute? Howard and Bob had uh, gone to the same college together. Mm. So Howard and Bob had gone to uh, what's, I think now it's called Rhodes College in Memphis. At that time, I think it was called Southwest College maybe. Uh, there's a book out about, and they had gotten involved in civil rights activities in Memphis together, um, picketing, I think, a Presbyterian church or something. Um, Howard, no doubt, will talk about, has talked about that in his interview because that he's very fond of that book that came out in recent years about it. But they knew each other. So Bob looked up Howard when he got to Atlanta and came to the Institute for Southern Studies. And Bob had already as a student, he had been a student at Union Theological Seminary and had started doing research projects on uh, military spending and things like that already. So he was deeply engaged in the whole process of working on research that was political uh, and uh, to look at developing reports and so forth. Um, so he, uh, he came, you know, he fit right in immediately and started work immediately. I don't think we even paid him initially. Um, and, and Bob is a very driven individual who works his ass off all the time. And uh, he just, uh, you know, I think he changed the dynamics of the Institute in many ways because he had, an, like Howard, he had a lot of ideas but he, he would uh, stick, he would toy with them and stay with them and make them work. Um, and I think he brought a lot, I've said this before, I think he brought a lot of organization uh, to the Institute and, uh, and, and it was his original idea to do the Southern Exposure. Mm -hmm. A great addition to the Institute. Yeah. But that's how we came to move. It was, it was uh, you know, keeping a marriage together at the time, which later dissolved, but not then. <laughs> and I should know this, or and I can certainly look it up, but when the Institute for Southern Studies moves to North Carolina, does it always remain independent or does it get absorbed by under the auspices of a university or get additional support always independent? Always independent. I haven't stayed in touch with this recent incarnation of the Institute, but they still, there is still something called the Institute for Southern Studies, which publishes not Southern Exposure, but Facing South. It became, um, a column uh, reporting more uh, a regular column reporting on um, southern issues and has a big I'm not has a big mailing list and and they issue regular things from there uh, and it has a small staff but it's always been independent and always seeks funding from uh, still see I, I think they still seek funding but yeah, it's remained independent, but remains um, uh, still formally the Institute for Southern Studies. 
And during your your fellowship year at Duke, what what were the parameters of that? Was it largely just giving you the space? Literally giving me the space. I could also attend. I also attended seminars. Uh, you know that was always been a part of my problem. I'm I'm uh, I like kibitzing and socializing and <laughs> being a part of things. So I I attended. Uh, you know, whatever seminars were going on or whatever presentations were going on. I had a little office uh, with a, uh, you know, a typewriter, not a computer. Um, and, um, and my transcripts. Um, and at time to sit there and edit those transcripts and work on them and think about uh, the book and so forth. Uh, and then sometime, and then I would also spend some time uh, working with the institute people as well. And did but you... I would go to I would go to Duke every day. I would drive from Chapel Hill to Duke, which at that time was quite easy, and uh, go to the office every day and and try to work on these uh, editing these interviews. And uh, would get, you know, at, at a certain point, got terribly. Uh, frustrated and jammed up about, I, you know, one day I was editing and I realized I'd taken, I looked at the page and I had, I had maybe one sentence left on the page and I thought I've got to get away from this. I can't, I, I, it's time to take a break from this. I can't, I'm not doing well here. Mm. Uh, and that was about the time I went to Highlander. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a, it was a, good place to be. I mean, I'm, you're sitting right there with uh, two, two people who, three people, because Jackie was there as well, and um, who are engaged in doing progressive history and oral history. And, and um, so it was a wonderful place to land for a year. And had you gotten support to have those many, many hours of the interview with Virginia transcribed, or did you do all that transcription? I did not do the transcription. Uh, Virginia had paid somebody to do, I think Virginia had paid for the transcriptions. I did not have to pay for it. I think yeah, Virginia right. paid for it. And the person who transcribed them is actually the person who ended up editing the book with her who mm. got interested in it from the hours she spent. She, she listened, uh, you know, she had listened to all those tapes. Uh, so she was very familiar with the, with the transcripts. And she's the one who, who helped Virginia bring it to publication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just one la last question. I'm with your relationship with with Jacqueline and and Leah and the you know, groundbreaking work that you all are doing in oral history, and then Jacqueline becomes the inaugural director of of this very well respected program, and then at Duke, and this is the nascent years of of developing oral history as as a method. Right. Uh, Do you have anything to say about about that moment and being part of you know something really transformative? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it um, I I don't think we were I I I would have been hard pressed certainly at the time to see it as for as transformative. But I, I was aware that we were a part of something that was new and that was, to me, very fulfilling. I, I, really, I really liked doing the interviews, um, not so much because of doing the interviews, but I liked interviewing people and getting their stories. And I liked adding their story to the, my view was that we were adding their story to the history of the times because their stories weren't that well known. For, Virginia was certainly well known, but uh, nobody had ever done an oral history interview with Virginia until Jacqueline asked that it be done for the Southern Oral History Program. Um, so it, it was very exciting. And then we met 
at that point, we also met Ted Rosengarten, who came to visit us in Atlanta. We became very good friends with Ted and Dale Rosen, his partner. But we knew Ted at that point, knew Ted quite well. And uh, Leah and I went off, there was a big Southern, there was a big oral history, what is it? Oral History Association meeting in Asheville, North Carolina during that time at the Grove Park Inn, this fancy, fancy, fancy inn hotel in Asheville, North Carolina. And of course, Lee and I didn't have the money to attend or, or to stay, certainly stay at the Grove Park Inn. But Ted was invited as a speaker, so he had a room. And we bucked in with him and went to all these, <laughs> went to all of these meetings and it was, uh, you know, so you were, and I was, we, we were also reading the official publications, you know, I was, I knew enough, I knew that there was a, a, a there was guides and books that would help you in terms of knowing how to do oral histories and what you needed to do. Um, for me, it was a way of, of using that using those guidelines, but also figuring out beyond that how to do the kind of interviews I wanted to do. And as I said, and Ted was actually very helpful because Ted talked a lot about his interviews with, uh, with uh, Ned Cobb, uh, i.e. Uh, Nate Shaw in the book. Uh, but, uh, he talked about going to with a you know a series of questions to Ned Cobb and ask and I think his initial question to Ned Cobb was um, tell me about how you got involved in the union and Ned Cobb's response was I was born in and it you know that story and that book you know taught me a lot about, you know, people's way of organizing. And, and Ted was, Ted said he had his own way of organizing his story. And it took me a while to get there with the ones I was interviewing, but I understood that to be true over time, that people do have their own organizations. And if you can let it come out in the interviews, it took me to Clay East to actually really truly understand that. I said a little bit about the interviews with Clay East earlier. Uh, the, the entire time I was visiting Clay in Tucson, he talked at me, uh, whether I had a tape recorder on or not. He was constantly telling me stories that he wanted to tell and share. And some of them I got, most of them I got on tape eventually, but I didn't get all of them on tape because he was just, uh, I, I was so tired uh, when I left. I've never been as tired from doing an interview as I was when I left Tucson and talking to Clay. And I thought, and I really did think that it, I had, that it was not a good interview. I just thought there was too many disparate stories and information. And it was only in the transcribing and, uh, and the editing that I began to understand that there were stories that I never would have, um, I never would have gotten had he, had he not done what he did, had he not sort of um, just told me what he needed to tell me. And they were, they were, um, there were stories that weren't, there were stories that told the story of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. They weren't just stories. There were stories that actually would, if you listened, would tell you about how things had gotten done inside that union and how things had occurred and who was involved. And um, so I thought from then on, I thought I really do have to listen more carefully to people. And um, a set of, I, I would not never go to an interview without a set of questions. But I, I also had to learn to listen beyond the questions. Mm -hmm. You can appreciate this. I, I uh, uh, doing oral history was one of the most um, draining work I had ever done. 
uh, once an interview was over, I would be completely drained because of, of the need to pay attention and listen and be present in a way that you're not often called to, to be, to do and be, which I, I'm sure you know this. Yes, but it's a, 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 for me, I find it to be a, an amazing interplay yeah. between, and between draining and exhausting and energizing. Like, yeah. not, and, and different interviews have a different proportionality of those things, but yeah, no, it's, it, yeah. it's work. What about at the, as I understand it, during this time, that oral history is sort of coming into being and getting more practiced, that not only is it new, but there's a fair amount of controversy around it um, as a legitimate yes, yes, doing things. Yeah. And, and I didn't know, and, and just to add to that, I didn't know until just these last days, I had told you before we started recording today that having listened to the, the past interviews that inspired me to go pull some things off my bookshelf, including Ted Rosengarten's uh -huh. And then I started being curious because I didn't know anything about his career or professional history. And I didn't realize that he stumbled upon this, this topic, the subject, while in a graduate program. And I guess was a miss, eventually drummed out of the program because they were like, that's not, that's not your original scholarship. That doesn't count. Right. And it was only after the publication of the book and and great reception that Harvard came back and was like, oh, by the way, we'll give you a PhD for that. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly right. They wouldn't, uh, they didn't think it was a dissertation. They wouldn't give him credit for it as a dissertation. And he insisted that they do that because of all the work that had gone into it. But they didn't want to do it initially, but eventually did. Yeah, so I, I was just curious of, of your thought being on the ground at the time, and although you're not tied to an academic career or uh, institution and have, you know, your well, there was, uh, there, within, the, within the association, I think, uh, there was all, it felt to me there was always a need to defend oral history as legitimate because it was, is, as you can tell in the interviews with me, the fog of people's memories uh, not being always correct. But, and so there was, people were taking great um, effort to triangulate it and to, to, to have research and uh, other, other primary sources and secondary sources to back up interviews to be uh, alongside the oral history interview and to see the oral history interview as a, a piece of that uh, research. I wasn't worried about those things because I was interested in more in people's stories that hadn't been told or and just I was also quite frankly just interested in documenting. I, uh, because I knew those stories hadn't been told and that some of those people, their stories would not be told unless you could grab them and do an oral history interview with them. Or the, um, the personal stories hadn't been told. There might be papers, for instance, from Claude Williams or um, Clifford Durer, but the stories weren't necessarily there unless you got them on tape. Uh, so I, I wanted to do that kind of documenting and get that story and then, and then um, edit it. I was always with, with no more moaning and, and I, I think with no more moaning it was brought home to me more than anything. Uh, but also even in the music interview for the bird, I was very aware of the power of the editor's pen 
and working with interviews because I knew that I could take, I could take um, a story with lots of pauses, lots of false starts or whatever, and turn it into to a readable document. And I did that for the publications, for both, uh, certainly for No More Moaning and for Articles in the Bird. But I was aware of my role in uh, transitioning that story from an oral document to a written document and the subtle uh, changes that I was making. So I thought there was, I thought the editor had a lot of power um, in those situations. So when I could, I would try to run those by the person I had interviewed uh, so that there was, uh, so people could see uh, what you know the editing and what had transpired and approve it um, and even e even with my dissertation later on the same thing um, so I think uh, I think there's a great responsibility in working with with oral history documents uh, if you're taking them to print or 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 using them as a way to shape a story that's going to be in written form rather than the, the voice form. I really, I, I think at that time there was not, I mean, you could certainly put the, the tape in, a, in an archive, but people would, would not want to spend time going back and put, you know, now, you know, the, the five inch reel to reel tapes that I used on the old newer tape recorder, nobody could find access to that kind of stuff. So people would have to rely on the, on the, the transcript of the interview. Um, but I don't think there was a chance, you know, doing the interviews like you're doing them for the Georgia State Archives and doing them digitally, I, it was not an option back then. But I think it's, I think it's a terrific way for people to access these stories because you cut out that editor in between. Uh, you take that position away and you're able to, to go back and hear people's voices and the pauses and the, you know, so forth, which uh, would, not, would not have remained in a document, in a story that was necessarily published, I think. I do have, uh, this is, talking about these oral history interviews has reminded me of one thing I wanted to go back to uh, from the earlier interviews because I talked in there about uh, what I had done with all of the country music interviews yeah. I, had, I had done. And, uh, and it was not a good story because I had, uh, uh, when I was moving uh, to go to grad school, I had just sort of dumped uh, those, uh, a box of interviews um, at the Country Music Museum and Library um, when, and Bill Ivey was still the director at the time. And I'd left a note with it. Nobody, I, I didn't call, I didn't make a, advance arrangements. I didn't do anything responsible like I should have done because I was focused on moving, I think. But I had dropped off all these interviews there and my assumption over the years was that someone had just tossed them because they didn't, didn't know who this person was who had dropped them off and thought they were just fan material or something. But last year, out of the blue, uh, I get a, a person who works at the Center for International Education where I went, did my graduate work at the University of Massachusetts called me or sent me an email and said, I need your address. We have some mail here for you and I want to forward it on. And so I sent her my mailing address and she forwarded to me a, a, a envelope that had, was at that point three months old, I think. Um, and it was from the Country Music Association, a Country Music Museum and Hall of Fame. And the director of the library there was writing to me to say they appreciated my contribution to the library. And they were having, um, they were having some sort of affair 
that I was being invited to participate in and come to. Um, and it was to uh, uh, acknowledge my gift to, to the library. From and 25 so, years later. <laughs> yes, all of these years later. And I was, it made me inordinately happy to know that those interviews are, are you know, presumably safe and, uh, you know, accessible, perhaps. I don't know. I haven't followed I, by this time, the event had already occurred, and I certainly couldn't have gone. But uh, and I haven't followed up. But I do plan to uh, when when the pandemic's over and I can get to Nashville, I plan to go and um, go try to meet go go there and see what what's happening with them. Oh, that's but really it, it's a it's a great end of the story. I wanted to yes. Yeah, uh, because I, knew, I re recall us talking about that yeah, having yeah, watched. Yeah watched the oral right. histories these last couple of days I remember and and uncharacteristic for me because I, I tend to be a very glass half empty and was trying to encourage you and was like they might be there and you were like no, <laughs> no, no. I was convinced and tossed them yeah yeah well I was very pleased with this and I do want to go I'd like to go see what's there I have I I didn't even write a note to myself about what I was taking there so but I'm pretty sure that the interview with Minnie Pearl is there and that uh, the two that I cared the most about and I thought had some depth to them were the interview with Minnie Pearl and the interviews with Wilma Lee and Stoney Cooper. Um, the others, the other, and maybe the one with Bob MacDill, who's a songwriter, um, which was a, a terrific interview that I just stumbled into. But um, the others were much shorter and perhaps more like a, a fan interview, but those those were excellent uh, in depth interviews, and so I hope they're I hope they're safe and available. Yeah, and you know what? Thanks for yeah, yeah. Of archivists that you know just can't yeah. help themselves from looking and what is yeah. This? <laughs> yeah. can't throw it away. And and they, of course, have moved, you know, at the point I dropped these off there, they were in a, they were, it was a fairly small building over on music, at the end of Music Row, and then, you know, now they have, they're in the middle of downtown Nashville in this huge, huge museum and uh, building and uh, performance space, even, right across from where the, uh, a big, um, um, I can't remember what it's called, but a big uh, arena where they have big performances and where the Predators, the Nashville Predators, play hockey. Um, so it's it's in a whole new location now, but clearly uh, part of the library there. So I'm very happy with the end of that story. Yeah, what great news. Yeah. I'm beginning to lose focus, so I think we should uh, plan for the next one. Yes, I agree, and and a and a great way to end, and a and a really clear, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we pick up. We're yeah, to yeah. a brand new topic and know right, right our direction. Well, let me go ahead and text Catherine just so that she can okay. come back in and. Uh, Oh, what great fun. Yeah. It's so nice to be doing this again. I enjoyed it again. So even though it's been a long time in between. Yes, which. Well, which I think I have uh, rep for, but I'm glad, very, very glad to be back into it. And, yeah. and Catherine rejoins us. I, I hope that that we can set up a, a, a bit of a schedule and Okay. And, okay. and something sort I of. Think, uh, uh, I think, uh, in, in terms of the way I think about it, I, I definitely want to talk about the years at Highlander and, uh, and then maybe sometime um, after that, going to grad, a little bit about what graduate school, why, why I went off to graduate school and, and the work that I did there, which again has to do with oral history interviews. Um, but, um, and, 
and the work I did later after getting the degree. So, but that I don't see as taking up a huge amount of time really. Um, but I would like to talk about um, Highlander and could be prompted, I'm sure, a, a lot about that period of time because that was a very rich, rich time for me. Yeah, and I'm extremely curious. I'm on much, much more unfamiliar territory there. Um, uh, so I'll be learning a lot. Um, but as we've been talking about with oral history in general, I think all of this is so, so important to be documented and you're the only person that can tell this. And I'm, I, I haven't followed up. I, I was aware, what was it? 12, 16 months ago of the fire that yeah, happened yeah, at Highlander yeah. that made yeah. my heart drop. Um, yeah, yeah. Burn the off the main, the main administration building room. Gone. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, it's been an institution that's been um, under attack off and on for its existence, although in recent years, I, I actually thought it was safe until this happened, so. But, but yeah, I, I'd like to talk about my time there, uh, but it's been, um, I left in 1986, so I've been away um, from the day-to-day -day life of Highlander. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't say it ended in 86 because I came back and stayed stayed in close touch for a few years after that and was an active board member for a while but certainly beginning by the mid 90s I was I was uh, distant and you'll certainly know like you saying that you know your your years there are now somewhat remote um, from the contemporary more contemporary period but just know sort of the the vogue of, of of what gets attention i would hunch that the the early years and the years when they were such a targeted institution and and when the miles this you know towering personality uh would get a lot of attention and people would really be right. deep into that history and maybe the years that you were there haven't gotten the attention yet. Um. Yeah, um, yeah, that's probably true. Although, uh, yeah, Miles was, uh, during the time I was there, Miles had been, I think we always called it, and he called it um, laughingly, discovered as an educator. So he was, he was getting a lot of, uh, those were the years when Highlander Islander is being recognized by the adult education uh, scholarly world and talk, more talked about in books um, and was often used, it was occasionally used as a conference site for people who were working in adult education. So, but he was also getting honorary degrees and speaking at universities and so forth during that time. So are you working on anything right now? I am not. Uh, I did, um, and, and I was thinking about this as I was going back and listening to some of our earlier interviews. I did take a, a course through the local library here about doing, um, I've never been interested in uh, genealogical research and I, apparently I'm still not, but I did take a course here and doing that because I wanted to go back and find out more about my father's family. Uh, and I still want to do that, but I haven't, um, I haven't done that. Um, just on a personal note, my, my, my retirement was somewhat upended by, my, by the illness of my sister who spent um, over a, a year and two weeks between hospitals and rehab centers. Uh, oh, she had uh, a rare disease called Guillain Barre. Uh, oh, which cool. I have a friend who mm -hmm. has the nervous system, and it, and she was quite. She was um, eighty eight when she had it, 
and 89 when she came home from, half, from a year of being hospitalized. So it took quite a while, but she's pretty much recovered from it. And she's been recovering, living and staying in my house yeah. as, as a, what we hope is a transition to being able to have her own small apartment. And she thinks she's getting ready for that now. But it, it basically has taken a good chunk of, of uh, my time and energy. Absolutely. And, and certainly my emotional energy. And so good that she, but so good that she has yeah, the recovery yeah. she, she had. Yeah. I, oh, it's, yeah. She's an amazing, she's a miracle story. Yeah. yeah because I yeah. had a friend in high school who, who had Guillaume Barre. Yeah. And, and I think he had it for, I, I don't know, I, he had it when I met him. Um, and he did progressively get somewhat better, but I think that there can be a fluctuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Resurges and yeah. the whole four years of high school, like he had never regained the ability to walk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was unusual in that it attacked her upper respiratory system more than her. It usually starts for people and their legs. Yes. And learning to walk is a, and, and she, and she did have to learn to walk again, um, with, i.e. the year, the months spent in a rehab center. But, um, but uh, she also had huge respiratory issues and, and still does. So we're very, uh, that's one of the reasons we are extra careful around the coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we have to be given her compromised immune uh, and respiratory system. Andy, do you have a lot more interviews to do uh, for, the, uh, for the bird? Are you continuing to do this series? When we conceived the project five or six years ago, it always was the intent that it would be open-ended and so long as there were still people interested or that, you know, we discovered that we would be more than happy to, to continue interviewing. But the list, we collaborated, it was a collaborative effort uh -huh. With me and Tracy involved, but also very, very uh, active input from from Tom and Stephanie and Steve and Bob, and uh -huh. drafting a list of of people that they thought and and Stephanie, I think, well, I guess probably all four of them had actually gone back through the issues and looked at the staff box or contribution who contributed to each if you, issue and made a list of of folks to that needed to be interviewed and i think that we're very close to closing in on the end of that there are a, a couple folks that are not atlanta based so um you know in in massachusetts i think lucia droby is um up there and then some maybe a maryland and a west virginia uh -huh. uh, also well, south maybe, maybe now you can do them by zoom and i think that that is largely what we're what we're looking to do um yeah so so all of that's coming along we'll see i also And I wish that <laughs> I wish we weren't being recorded right now. Um, <laughs> you can you can tell me later if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I would like to um, either have another Zoom or do you do WhatsApp on your phone? Uh, I haven't yet. Uh, okay, it, it, it's you can use it as a texting service, but it also has a video function. Uh huh. Um, but maybe we can just have a phone call and I can- Oh, that would be great, yeah. I can update you on some, some things going on professionally with, in, in, in my work. Um, oh, great, I would love to do that. And, and also, I'm really, I, I want to talk to you just as a, a, 
just as a conversation, just a okay. conversation about um, about your life story. Okay. And what you what you think of it, and what you you your intentions for, you know, we're documenting it here, but. Yeah. Do you ever do you ever think of writing some well, collection uh, memoir? No, uh, I don't. I mean, I, I we did the book deep in our hearts, uh, and I did the chapter and and there and um, and really felt like that was. I really felt like that was enough in terms of what I want to, I guess what I want to say. Um, I, I, I'm very aware, I, I feel guilty sometimes because I know that you've done interviews with people like Reber and Jean and other people and they haven't taken up as much time as I have on these interviews with you. So I think, why am I, why am I so talkative or why am, why am I taking up so much of the Georgia State Archives time with my interview when other people I know have finished and gone on? So I feel a little like, I don't know, um, self-conscious about the number of hours that it's taken to get me, get me through this. And, and, and it's not, but it's not to say that, that there will not be more interviews with Jean or yeah, yeah. I, I think I think part of that was is you know the vagaries of of just time and place and and people's yeah. people's interests how how much they have to reflect on but I remember and uh, unfortunately the interview with Jean was one of the very early ones so we hadn't quite gotten our sea legs but yeah. also you know Jean was making a visit to Atlanta and you know it was just an afternoon and the same with Reber like yeah, yeah. They, they happened to be there for a very discreet amount of time and we and great interviews and and I'm sure I know having talked with other people and read more that there's so much other ground that could be covered um yeah well, I really appreciate the way that you're going about these because I think uh, I, I'm as good an example, I think, as anybody in terms of someone who was at the bird, who, who, but whose life went way beyond the bird in terms of other organizations and other affiliations and uh, like-minded work um, that went beyond the bird, but uh, anchored in some ways in our interest in the bird. Yeah, and, and and you know, so many of your 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 friends and peers, their lives just continually unfolded yeah. with these yeah. additional chapters and really fascinating stories. And I think that, as we were saying before we started recording today, or I was saying, like, I think that there's a big story that can be told a, using the bird as an anchor or as a, a focal point, but rather than necessarily talking about like an institutional or even cultural history of the paper, that it's more an exploration of an era and the people that animated that era. Uh -huh. And and all their whole life um, and not just a period of that life um, mm -hmm. that I think speaks to, to something very powerful about the second half of the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I have a, I have a free Zoom app. Uh, so if you have that app on your iPhone or computer, we could also chat uh, using just that offline. But um, just send me an email and we can at least have a phone conversation. I would like that.
Yeah, yeah. And let me, I'm actually going to get on my phone. I, I sent Catherine a text inviting her to, to jump back in and close out the interview with us, but she might not have received it. So I'm now going to try phoning yeah. her. Catherine. Yes, we're just we're just wrapping up if you'd like to pop back on and close out with us. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. That's why that's why I figured I was like, well, maybe I'll make the phone ring and see. <laughs> okay, see you in a second. Bye bye. Will Mona need to come back on as well? I guess so, right? I, th I think that Catherine will wrap up with us and then she, we can log off and then she and oh. Mona will, will coordinate. Um, well, I'm glad you could do this via Zoom.